Good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in this morning's first uh, panel. Uh, allow me to introduce myself first. My name is Todd Lucero Salas. I'll be your moderator for this particular panel. I am currently enrolled in the Master in History program of the University of San Carlos in Cebu City. And I am a professional genealogist and a town historian based here in Cebu City. Uh, I'd like to remind our three speakers uh, for this panel that they are only allotted 20 minutes for their discussion. And I encourage all the participants to ask their questions during the open forum, which we will have right after the third speaker is done with his presentation. Uh, you may also just write your questions uh, in the Q&A box that you can see on your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to call on our first presenter for this panel. He is a faculty member of the Mary School in Marikina, Philippines, and he will talk about screening the encounter, historiography, and the battle of Mactan in films. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. John Adrian Fur Atienza. Good morning uh, to everyone. Let me first share my uh, presentation. Uh, maayos po ba akong naririnig, uh, Sir Moderator? Yes. Um, once again, uh, is it uh, pleasant? Good morning to all of us. Isang magandang araw po sa ating lahat. Uh, um, first of all, before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank you, uh, PHA, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity po in presenting my paper. Uh, my paper is entitled Screening the Encounter, Stereophoty and the Battle of Mactan and Films. Uh, recently, the wait lang po. Recently, the Elcano and Magellan became a popular discussion on the internet. An animated film produced in Spain, it retells the 16th century voyage of the Portuguese Ferdinand Magellan and the Spanish Juan Sebastian Elcano. Majority of the discussion dwells on the portrayal of the characters in the film, wherein both Magellan and Elcano were seen as protagonists while the native people as antagonists. The film's Eurocentric uh, representation of the journey sparked massive local outrage, uh, uh, mostly centering on the infuriation, on the manner on the film painted uh, Lapu Lapu, and the cultural representation of the indigenous people. With the public involving themselves on film inaccuracies, it unveils several history-related discussions, most of which revolves around the topics about the incoming quincentennial celebration of the circumnavigation, making history films as an initial avenue for historical discussions. Over the past decade, the emergence of various types of films that have historical themes can be observed. Since 2008, after the release of Baler by Mark Nelly, History films have continued its huge production in local cinemas, making the public aware of history. The emergence of the production of history films also leads to the emergence of necessary studies in the relation between film and history, a and, um, and topic which is often overlooked. Uh, this paper articulates the filmic representation of the Battle of Mactan by analyzing two known history films about the event, namely Lamberto Avellanas Lapu Lapu, which was produced in 1955, and William Mayo's Lapu Lapu, which was produced in 2002. It also introduces the concept of Hayden White, uh, termed as historiophoty, as, the, as a framework in the study of films, uh, together with the use of textual, contextual, and intertextual analysis. It pre, uh, the paper presents the process of, of how the films depicted and imagined the Battle of Makta and other related events. The paper is divided into four parts, namely uh, the, a brief introduction of historiophoty, uh, what is the meaning of history film and its brief history in the local cinema. The third part dwells on the representation and the, then the reconstruction of the Battle of Mactan and uh, comparing it with historical accounts. 
And the fourth one uh, revolves around the contextual discourse surrounding the films. Lastly, conclusions. And since this is a working paper, uh, suggestions and recommendations are uh, well appreciated. So uh, history of OT is a concept termed in the 1980s by uh, scholars Hayden White and, Rosens and Robert Rosenstock. And it is a focal point in the development in the emergence of the study of film and history. Uh, the historical interpretation in the film form was termed by White as historiography, wherein he defined this as the representation of history in visual image and filmic discourse. He compared it with the concept of historiography, which is the traditional form of history or the representation of history in verbal discourse due to the fact that many had often tend to compare the medium of the film with the medium of written history. Um, uh, both have argued that the medium has its own unique way of conveying historical knowledge that suggests new structures and perspectives of looking at the past, which also presents a unique challenge to historians in this process of analyzing films. Now, um, historiography is a wide concept, and uh, one type of historiography is the history film, which, is, which can be defined as uh, a cinematic representation of anything that happened in the past. So um, the uh, history film in the history of the local cinema, um, it is often unknown that the first films released in the Philippines were about history. Okay, uh, during the 1910s, it is uh, considered that six history films were produced wherein uh, most of which uh, dwells and revolves around the life of Jose Rizal and his novels. The year of 1912 can be considered as a focal point or an essential period in the development of local history films and the over, overall cinema history of the Philippines, wherein during the year, directors, uh, namely Edward Gross and Albert, Albert Wiersley, produced the first films in the Philippines and tried to outdo each other in producing the very first film about Jose Rizal. Um, interestingly, in the same year, uh, a film entitled La Conquista de Filipinas, which is also directed and produced by Albert Yearsley, was released. Uh, the Yearsley film was seen to possess themes of history, uh, including uh, the events from the pre-colonial period during the uh, until the, uh, the early arrival of the uh, Spanish forces in the Philippines, the early years of foreign occupation, and, the, and including a scene uh, of the Pacte de Sangre between Raja Matanda and uh, Miguel Lopez de Legas. Uh, considering the notion that the film depicted the early encounter between the Spaniards and the Filipinos, it, it sheds a high possibility that the Battle of Mactan is also presented in the film, evoking La Conquista de Filipinas as the first medium to represent the Battle of Mactan in the silver screen. Although uh, research, uh, a lot of research is needed, to support this postulation, but it is an interesting note uh, given, uh, considering uh, that Nick de Ocampo uh, states that La Conquista de Filipinas is, the, is possibly the first uh, Filipino produced film seven years ahead of the Jose Nepomuceno, Jose Nepomuceno's Dalagang Book. Uh, since, the, uh, uh, since the majority of local films produced in the 1930s and before were lost, it can be considered that the first local film that remains to publicly feature the battle was Lamberto Avellana's 1955 Lapu-Lapu film. Um, it can be watched in the uh, site at a site in the internet hosted by Mike De Leon, wherein he also hosts a lot of old films as, uh, since 1950s are there. So Avellana was a director of seven history films. And in, in his 15, uh, in his 50 year career, uh, he has created seven of those, including Lapu Lapu, which was produced in uh, 1955 under LVN Pictures. Uh, the Lapu Lapu film was adopted from Francisco Cochin's uh, comic series with the same title, Lapu Lapu, which, which was also produced uh, in the same decade. Uh, 
the most discernible quality of the Conching piece and the Avellana film was the presentation of Lapu-Lapu's backstory, which were absent in major historical resources. He was personified, was giving a, a given a characteristics, and an, and an elaborated life narrative with fiction personas. And in addition, the film was part of the cinematic trend during the 1950s wherein uh, uh, most films were adopted and uh, referenced from uh, several comic series. So here are uh, pictures of the filmmaking of the Lapu Lapu in 1955. So in the first picture, uh, you can see there uh, Abeliana using the cinematic technique of glass shot in capturing a scene of the film. The second picture is uh, the shooting of the arrival of the three ships of the Spanish of the Spaniards. And the last picture is Aveliana together with uh, his film crew in the set of the LVN pictures of Lapu Lapu. Um, it took almost a half a century for another film of the Inmaktan encounter. In the early 2000s, the film Lapu Lapu was released under Kalinawan Records, uh, I mean Kalinawan Cineworks. It is a film entry of the 28th Metro Manila Film Festival and was directed by William Mayo. Uh, the same with the Aveliana film. It is a depiction of the life story of Lapu Lapu, which uh, the, uh, the difference is the Mayo film provided more detailed uh, detail in representing the sociocultural setting of the film. With a huge budget of 35 million, Mayo and the film producers attempted to portray uh, the 16th century native landscape with the particular cultural elements which are said to be based from historical sources. So in analyzing uh, history films, Berkhofer Jr. and Rosenstone noted that it is necessary to compare it with uh, historical accounts. In order to be regarded as, as a historical medium, the film contents must be context with the current historical knowledge. The film should serve as a starting point for discussion, issues, and ideas related to the ongoing historical discourses. In relation with this, the film can be evaluated and investigated based on the current method of understanding historical knowledge. The visual data in the films, particularly uh, the dialogue, the character, the setting, the environment, can be compared with uh, historical accounts uh, to find the veracity and authenticity of the medium as a valid representation of history. Um, now, the Battle of Mactan is uh, here's a brief overview. Uh, both films have a similar linear narrative uh, composed of two elements of fiction and history. Fictional in the sense that the first part or the uh, earlier parts of the film depicted or reimagined Lapu Lapu's life which were clearly absent in historical references. And the, the concluding part uh, uh, seemed to be historical in the sense that uh, the events were based during the 1521 um, events that, were, can, that can be found in several historical accounts. In comparing with uh, historical accounts, the film is divided into three parts. Uh, firstly, uh, the refusal of Lapu Lapu, the arrival of the Spanish in Mactan, of uh, Spanish conquistadores at Mactan, and the Battle of Mactan. So it is a it is a well known data that uh, the immediate reason of the Battle of Mactan was the refusal of Lapu Lapu to obey the King of Spain. Although uh, a long history uh, 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 happened after, uh, before the Battle of Mactan. But the main, uh, the main reason why the, Makta, the Battle of Mactan happened is the refusal of Lapu Lapu, uh, which uh, Pigapeta reported through Zula, who stated that uh, Lapu Lapu or si Lapu Lapu uh, uh, refused to obey the King of Spain and prevented Zula from doing it. So uh, this particular Zula scene was uh, depicted in the Aviana version, wherein the uh, uh, Director Aveliana presented the negotiation moment. So uh, after uh, Magellan find, found out that uh, Lapu Lapu refused to obey uh, to uh, to the King of Spain or to the Spanish conquistadores, he sent a group of people to negotiate with Lapu Lapu to adhere uh, to confirm with the Spanish forces. 
And this negotiation scene was uh, depicted in the uh, in the Avellana uh, movie, wherein the, uh, the a group of Spanish soldiers, including Enrique, uh, arrive at Lapos at Lapolapos house, and attributes of xenophobia were witnessed in the manner of Lapolapo approached the Spanish after discovering the intention of the foreigners, which is to convince the chief to kiss the hand of Humabon as the representative of Spain in the island. Lapu-Lapu frantically refused, yelling out the quoted text presented in the PowerPoint. So he refused uh, to, uh, to adhere to the Spanish uh, conditions. Uh, on the other hand, the Maya version depicted this scene uh, in a more straightforward way. Uh, in, their, in their invitation of cooperation, uh, the Spanish conquistadores stated the conditions uh, like tribute of payment, declaration of Humabon as the island's ruler, renewal of faith to Christianity, and most importantly, confirming to the Spanish sovereignty, all of which were um, refused by Lapu-Lapu. Uh, although, uh, although the natives were given a choice, obey or else they will experience the sword of the conquistadores, Lapu-Lapu replied with disagreement and refusal, obviously presenting resistance and valor. So it is all... Uh, it is also important to know that um, that Figapeta also noted in his account that the islanders were not terrified and they replied that they also had lances, uh, uh, reeds, and wood, wood hardened with fire. And in the Maya version, it is reinterpreted and reimagined through the line of uh, Lapu-Lapu stating that uh, the edges of our lances are prepared whenever you, are, you attack. So since uh, uh, it is uh, the re the refusal of Lapu-Lapu is manifested, so Magellan at uh, consequently takes the matter took the matter in his hands. So the film, uh, both films, um, reimagined the arrival of the Spanish forces in Mactan in different ways. The Avellano version reimagined the uh, the event with several boats, as you can see in the screen. Um, uh, arriving in the shores uh, and consequently unloading passengers and soldiers in the shore. Uh, the depiction of the event was also corralled with a background voice that narrates the manner on how the Magellan force downplayed the, uh, the natives, uh, stating that uh, it is unnecessary to use handheld art artillery when fighting against the indigenous forces. However, the clear motives of the narration, uh, as stated in the screen, is to establish tension and build up on the heroism of Lapu-Lapu as it tells uh, in the quoted text. So uh, throughout the Avellana, the Avellana film, uh, the, the, the praise, uh, Duguna Koyomangi is often cited and often uh, uh, part of the monologue of Lapu-Lapu. And that, uh, the reason of that will be uh, discussed later. Uh, on the other hand, the Maya version displayed the arrival of the Spaniards with uh, firstly presenting a series of shots that presents the foreigners ship firing the island of Mactan with native artillery. And, uh, subsequently, the view shifted towards the shores of Mactan, wherein Lapu-Lapu can be witnessed uh, standing, waiting for the enemy. The film then uh, focused on the three boats approaching the islands and as the Spaniards landed on the shores, the Mactan people can be seen readying themselves for battle. So in addition to this, the, the Maya version, which, which are absent, which were absent in the Avellano version, uh, showed the group of Humabon and Zula present in the islands as spectators of the battle. So in the historical accounts, it is stated that Magellan had invited both Rahas, but said to take no part in the battle against Lapu-Lapu. Uh, obviously, uh, presenting European superiority and divine providence. Um, so the Battle of Mactan uh, is visualized through uh, several uh, uh, first uh, several shots. So first of uh, the first thing is to be noted is that then uh, the Spanish conquistadores firstly attack the uh, territory of the inhabitants, setting their houses with fire. So contrary to the uh, historical accounts, it is uh, the, set, uh, the, the action of the uh, Spanish conquistadores to set the houses on fire was a reaction 
to their uh, downplayed forces. With the enraging fire consuming their island, Lapu-Lapu and his fellow men reacted and engaged against the foreigners. And soon, uh, scores of sword fight scenes uh, between the foreigners and the natives were uh, rendered in the field until the view shifted to the battle between Lapu-Lapu and Magellan, uh, which is the last photo. And the duel presented, uh, the duel was presented in uh, filmic cuts and close-ups of both fighters' facial expression, accompanied with an intense background music, uh, which uh, uh, shows the brilliancy of the Abeliana cinematography. Lapu-Lapu later dealt the final blow as scenes of retreating Spanish forces were flashed in the screen. Uh, in comparison with the Maya version, uh, it was lengthier and more action-packed when compared to the Maya, uh, with the Avellano version. Considering the late, the late the, uh, Mayo or uh, William Mayo is a director known to produce action films throughout his uh, filmic career. Uh, so again, uh, several scenes of uh, natives and foreigners fighting were uh, presented in the screen. And again, uh, the duel between Lapu-Lapu and the uh, Magellan were the dinoma of the movie, with Lapu-Lapu stomping Magellan with a hard log. The latter lost his balance and fell to the ground. The navigator shakingly stood up and continued the fight. However, the Mactan chief uh, overpowered him and subsequently slashed him in the neck that resulted to his death. So in perspective, it can be stated that most of the scenes displayed in the film were either based or influenced from historical accounts, although integrated with the uh, director's creative film with liberty. So the visual uh, expositions of the arrival of Mactan, the indigenous battle cries, the usage of artilleries, the clash between the foreigners and the natives, all of these were mentioned in the historical accounts. However, the core and central historical moment of the films were, was missing in the accounts, of which was the duel between Lapu-Lapu and Magellan. No evidence had emerged to support the actual encounter of the two individuals. However, regardless, it is widely reconstructed in the visual medium that the clash between them did happen. And it is uh, due and streaming from certain necessities. So uh, the portrayal of the duel between Magellan and Lapu-Lapu uh, resulted from contextual necessities of both films. And in the respective decades of production, there is a search of a Filipino identity. The 1950s was defined as the initiation of nationalist movement uh, spanning from uh, politics, academe, and literature circles. And, uh, and, and in, on par with that movement, the film industry also, in, uh, also participated. And Avellana, in the process, uh, did his job by creating several films that reflect nationalist sentiments and a search of a Filipino national identity. So uh, he produced films in the decade. Uh, he produced uh, several films, namely Hantik, Hook sa, pa sa Bagong Pamumuhay, Lapu-Lapu, Walang Sugat, Bajaw. And uh, all of these films reflects uh, uh, nationalist Filipino uh, and, a and a production of a liberal citizen as a response to the modern modernization anxieties of the media. Uh, in the same plane, the Mayus Lapu-Lapu was also uh, a reflection of their uh, context. So it is a residue of the 1990s Centennial Celebration, wherein uh, several films have incorporated patriotic and nationalist sensibilities in the themes of their films. So as Ariola notes, uh, there is a frantic search for historical materials and personalities as film subjects during the decade. And that's why there are several uh, there are several films that were produced in the 1990s, like uh, three films on Jose Rizal, uh, Jose Rizal by Marilu Dai Sabaya, the Bayani Third World film by Mike De Leon. And this is uh, the, uh, the film of Lapu-Lapu is a reflection of the continuation of the National Building Exposition of the 1990s decade. Now, the films have reconstructed the native imagery of Balor reflected in the cinematic characterization of Lapu-Lapu through his actual participation in the battle. 
The necessary portrayal of a decisive leader must be presented in order to stress his enduring attitude of valor and macho image. Uh, thus, an appropriate symbol, uh, an appropriate patriotic symbol. In addition, the importance of painting Lapu-Lapu as the leader and actual character who have dealt the final blow in the battle through Madeleine's death is a vital reconstruction of the encounter. The battle depicted in the film wasn't an ordinary battle. It is, it is a significant battle that symbolizes the, nation, the nation's victory and presents Lapu-Lapu as a valid construction of a national symbol rendered to fulfill the historical needs of a society during their respective production periods. Hence, a filmic reconstruction that serves as an allegorizing factor of the themes relating to anti-Western and anti-colonial discourses, which is pivotal in the search on the creation of Filipino identity. Uh, and now I, uh, I end my presentation by uh, uh, stating or in uh, calling for a study of history films in the, in the local cinema. So uh, I have collected almost or more than 100 films that presented history in the silver screen. Um, and I tabled it by decade with uh, the number of films in the particular decade. So this means that uh, there's a need, there's a necessity to study the history films since this is a major uh, uh, undertaking in the development of the historical discipline. So other than the presented uh, contextual discourses, um, uh, it is also noted that the films also engages with the public, evoking the unique potency and the potential of films as a medium of representing and retaining history. So um, the in inaccuracies of the film, the film errors or the historical errors presented in the film can serve as an initial discussions uh, for his uh, for the between the people and the historian, so the uh, the public can be actively engaged with history. And I end with this note from Mark Pero, which he suggested that there uh, must be a new take on the history of film. He notes an interpretation which springs solely from their own analysis and which is no longer merely a reconstruction or or a reconstitution, but really an original contribution to the understanding of the past phenomena and their relation to the present. So uh, I end my presentation there. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Mr. Atienza. So let's now call on our second speaker. Our second speaker is from the Philippine Science High School in the Sock Sargent Region Campus in Coronadal City. To discuss haunting of the hunting grounds, the Ilaga in Polomolok, South Patabato. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Marlon B. Lopez. Good morning po. I hope uh, nadidinig po ako ng, uh, ng maayos. Yes, your sound is okay. Thank you po. So I will be presenting my research. Good morning once again. I will be presenting one of my researches on martial history, actually local history. Uh, entitled The Hunting of the Hunting Grounds, The Ilaga of Pulumulok, South Patabato. Let me, uh, allow me to share screen. I don't know kung naka full screen po. Uh, Paki-clarify. No, hindi. Sorry. Okay, so good morning once again. I am Marlon D. Lopez, a high school a high school teacher from Philippine Science High School. Sox Surgeon Region Campus. I will be presenting one of my exploratory studies on local martial law history entitled Hunting of the Hunting Grounds, the Ilaga in Pulumulok, South Cotabato. This study will focus on the activities of the Ilaga in Pulumulok, South Cotabato. The initial discussion will dwell on a brief discussion of uh, the history of Pulumulok since I believe a very few of us know, are familiar of the place. The succeeding discussions will focus 
on the Ilaga as an organization, then their activities in Pulumulok as the main topic of the study, and some concluding remarks. Um, for the information po ng lahat, I am presenting the study not just to add to the existing body of knowledge, but also, um, you know, uh, not just to add to the existing body of knowledge about the martial law and its history, but to re-strengthen a, a currently challenged historical notion that, let me be clear with this, I really believe on this, that Marcos is a no hero. The locale of the study is Pulumulok. It's a highly urbanized municipality in the Philippines located approximately 40 kilometers away from Coronadal. South Cotabato's provincial capital and roughly around 17 kilometers from General Santo City, the, ano, no, the, the home of Manny Pacquiao. Uh, it has 23 barangays with Barangay Poblacion as the municipal administrative and economic center. As of 2015, po, Pulumulok's population had reached 152,589, ripening to becoming a city. Dole Philippines Incorporated is located in Pulumulok. Unsurprisingly, of course, because Pulumulok has a very fertile soil and very conducive for agriculture. Uh, Pulumulok is dubbed in 2016 as Mindanao's wealthiest in, uh, municipality with an annual income of 1.47 billion pesos. So just a brief history of Pulumulok. The name came from two fused land terms, uh, Flomlok, which means hunting ground or cradle of hunters. Uh, Pulumulok was first called home by the Blaans who were skilled hunters in the thick forest of the place. Then the Manginda now started to arrive and peacefully coexist with the Blaans as the rich vegetation, fertile soil, and cool waters attracted the skilled farming Magindanaos in settling in the place. Pulumulok became a home for two of Mindanao's indigenous people. In June, of, June 3 of 1939, Pulumulok together with Lagao, known today as General Santa City, the municipality of Tupi and Marbel, today known as Coronadal, was surveyed and opened as a part of the National Land Settlement Administration, the Philippine government's means of attracting settlers to resettle in the land of promise. Well, it's a land of promise if you're the settler, but if you're the indigenous people, I think it's the opposite. Anyways, Pulumulok has a total surveyed land of 18,000 hectares, 13,000 of which was reserved for the migrant settlers coming from mainly from uh, Visayas, but others are coming from, uh, were coming from Luzon. 1.5 hectares for each family. It took three months for, or, uh, for more than 300 settlers to settle in Pulumulo. By August 21, 1957, through EO number 264, signed by the former President Carlos P. Garcia, Pulumulo became a municipality. It separated from the then municipality of General Santos. Then in 1963 of December 7, Dole Philippines started operation with a starting land area of 5,569 hectares. Uh, let's fast forward to September 21, 1972. The day when the late President Ferdinand Marcos declared or placed the entire Philippines under martial law. Quote, to maintain law and order throughout the Philippines, prevent or suppress all forms of lawless violence, as well as any act of insurrection or rebellion, and to enforce obedience to all the laws and decrease orders and regulations promulgated by the president himself. Uh, hence, it was the rebellion and insurrection as the prime reason for the imposition of the martial law. The communists were cited to be the prime threat to the republic referred to by the Marcos regime. Since the 1972 Marshall Declaration, reports of violence ensued and the government declared the communists public enemy number one. Isn't it? I don't know. Sounds familiar. Anyways, uh, those violence and atrocities ensued um, and massacres surfaced. To name a few, we have the Jabida Massacre of March 18, 1968, Manili Massacre of June 19, 1971, Takub Massacre in Lanao del Norte in October 24, 1971, and um, it should, uh, I was actually supposed to form part, uh, I mean to include Malisbong Massacre in Palimbang Sultan Kudara because it's one of I don't know, the most horrific and the most terrible incidents um, perpetrated by the Ilaga. However, because of the pandemic, I was not able to, I know, uh, go to the field and then research there. So, uh, pulumulok lang yung na-include sa presentation. So, in uh, the Malisbong Massacre uh, occurred in September 24, 1974. Let me, ano, 
let me uh, focus on Jabida and Manili. The Jabida massacre was, of course, a massacre of Moro army recruits. Alam naman natin siguro lahat. Uh, uh, by the members of the government troops on March 18, 1968, which is acknowledged as the major flashpoint that ignited the Moro insurgency in the Philippines. While the Manili massacre was the mass murder of 70 to 79 Moros, including women and children. Uh, in a mosque in Manili, Carmen, North Cotabato, on June 19, 1971. The Moro residents of the town had gathered in their mosque to participate in a supposed peace talks with Christian groups when an armed men dressed in uniform similar to those worn by members of the Philippine Constabulary opened fire against them. It was suspected that the Ilaga militant group were prime suspects, but there were allegations that the Philippine Constabulary had collaborated with the Ilaga. This brought the Ilaga to an unsavory reputation. The incident resulted to increase hostilities between the Moros and the settler population in Mindanao. So um, the Jabida massacre actually was an, uh, being pegged as really the, the, the primary or the key factor on the formation of the Moro secessionist movement. The MIM or the Mindanao Independence Movement was organized in May 1, 1968, roughly more than two months after the infamous Jabida massacre occurred. Former governor of Cotabato, Dato Udtug Matalam, issued a manifesto for the declaration of a Muslim independent movement that sought for an independent Muslim state from the Philippines comprising Mindanao, Sulu, and Palawan regions. It was later renamed as the Mindanao Independence Movement, assuring non-Muslims in Cotabato that they were included in the envisioned state. However short-lived, the Mindanao Independence Movement played a key role uh, in the formation of Miswari's National Liberation Front. By this manifesto, the ensuing animosity among the settlers and Moros, the Ilaga was organized. So how was the formation came? Uh, the Ilaga was led by Feliciano Luz's first a Christianized Tirurai, and uh, in Pulumulok, it was led by Norberto Manero Jr. The Magnificent Seven responded to Udtug Matalam's Mindanao Independence Movement. The Magnificent Seven were, according to uh, key informants, seven settler mayors uh, of Cotabato and Sultan Kudarat, headed by Nicolas de Kenya of Midsayap, North Cotabato, together with Wetsislao de la Serna, Pacifico de la Serna, um, Bonifacio Tejada, Conrado Lemada, Jose Escribano, and Esteban Duruelo, organized the infamous Ilaga led by Feliciano Luces, a Christianized Tirodai popularly known as Commander Toothpick. Little is known about Luces, but he gained notoriety due to his command of the Ilaga. Um, earlier said they were implicated in the Manili massacre, but was never brought to trial. The Ilaga gained legitimacy by the virtue of the Presidential Decree Number 1016, which formed the Integrated Civilian Home Defense Forces to aid the military in the Integrated National Police in subduing criminalities and local rebellion forces. The Integrated Civilian Home Defense Forces was a unit of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, which was trained to augment military presence and activities in the local communities of the nation, especially localities in the rural areas of the country. General Jose Crisol, Deputy Minister of Home Defense and Architect of the Integ Integrated National Police, described the Integrated Civilian Home Defense Forces as a unit against lawless elements and to assist law enforcement agencies in restoring peace and order. Deputy Minister of Civil Military Relations, Colonel Carlos Cajelo, once a military provincial commander and member of Philippine Parliament, bestowed the Ilaga as a part of the Barangay Self-Defense Unit as a bulwark group against the Muslim secessionists in Mindanao. The ICHDF, or the Integrated Civilian Home Defense Forces, was to replace the BSDU, or the Barangay Self-Defense Unit, in the middle of the 1970s. Reorganization soon followed, and one of the units that were created was the Manero faction, whose headquarters was situated in Pulumulok, South Cotabato. Brigadier General Delfin Castro assigned Norberto Manero Jr. as the commanding officer of the ICHDF Special Strike Force under the Special Warfare Group. Informants would claim that the Ilaga became a formidable force against the more insurgents due to their amulets and talismans claimed to have powers through incantations, making them bulletproof. And some reports saying, saying gave them the ability to levitate and become invincible. This has not been uh, validated yet. So studies must be um, done also. 
much of what is now known of Ilaga and Punumulok would always go back to the Maneros of Quinulis, South Cotabato. The Manero brothers, nine brothers in total, became a legend in martial law stories due to their exploits against the Black Shirts or Moro fighters. Norberto Jr., a.k.a. Commander Bukay, was implicated to the killing of Italian priest Father Tullio Favalli in 1985 in La Esperanza, Tuluna, North Cotabato. Father Favalli was the first foreign missionary to be killed in martial law era. Now what about the actions in Pulumulok? What about their actions in Pulumulok, South Cotabato? In my study, it will dwell on two incidents. The murders of Pastor Ferdinand Guimon and the brothers Ali and Mambawatan Mamalumpong. Pastor Fernando Guimon was a Blaan pastor residing in Pastor Ferdinand Fernando Guimon was a Blaan pastor residing in Kinilis, Pulumulok, South Cotabato. Pastor Guimon also owned a land commonly owned by the local Blaan people in the place which they were able to own under ancestral rights. The land was considered prime due to soil fertility and geography as it is very plain and conducive for agriculture. On May 29, 1977, according to Edgar Arguelles in a sworn statement, stated that Leonardo Lacson Manero ordered George Manero to massacre the Blaan communities in Barangay Kinilis. As to the reason for the order, it was never clear. However, an anonymous informant told the researcher that it was due to the, lands, to the land owned by the Blaans in the area. With this order to massacre innocent indigenous peoples in Pulumulok, specifically the Blaans of Barangay Kinilis, some Ilaga men, which was led by George Manero, raided the house of Pastor Fernando Guimon and ordered the pastor and his family to kneel down while they interrogated them. George Manero asked the pastor of his identity, which the pastor responded accordingly. After the interrogation was done, George Manero told Pastor Guimon in Ilongo, Hindi ka na mabuhi no, or in English translated as, You won't live anymore, which the pastor responded with a jubilant reply saying, Praise the Lord, hallelujah which was then followed by a gunshot from Manero's shotgun, instantly killing Pastor Fernando Guimon. Argilius then further stated that the men accompanying George Manero, which was identified only by their first names, Uldarico, Sidonio, Chris, and Ronnie, killed the rest of the Guimon family members who witnessed the shooting of their Padre de Familia. The rest of the family members were hacked by the samurais that the Ilaga members were carrying with them. The next incident is the killing of Ali and Mambawatan Mamalumpong. Ali Mamalumpong and Mambawatan Mamalumpong were residents of Barangay Kinilis, Pulumulok, South Cotabato, and was making livelihood out of their own land in the said barangay. Peace and quiet was their everyday life until the fateful day of November 5, 1977. According to George Puntilla, a witness furnished by the Justice and Peace Social Action Center, gave a statement that the brothers were abducted from their residence on that day and were taken into custody. They were taken to the headquarters of the Ilaga in the similar barangay in Pulumulo. George Puntilla, an ex-member of Manero faction, cut relations with the Maneros after seeing the ritualistic cannibalism of the Maneros, supposed cannibalism of the Maneros. He testified that the Mamalumpong brothers to their, uh, was brought to the farm of the Maneros in Kinilis the brothers were then hugged and were subjected to torture by beating them with their rifle butts. He further stated that the Mamalumpong brothers, nearly, nearly dead due to intense battering, were killed by the Ilaga, shooting them and chopping into pieces. And according to George Puntilla, eaten. Lara Gonzaga, Larry Gonzaga, sorry, a follower of the Maneros, took a body of the Mamalumpong and, give, and gave it to Puntilla as a proof of their ritual. Another witness, Pipito Moderacion, a member of the 453rd Philippine Constabulary Command in Camp Lira, General Santos, also stated in an affidavit dated October 1977 that he was ordered by his superior commanding officer, First Lieutenant Antonio P. Billiones, to join covertly the ICHDF faction of Norberto Manero Jr. and Leonardo Lacson Manero. He stated that he witnessed the abduction of, the, of Ali and Mambawatang Mamalumpong from the residence in Kinilis, Pulumulok, South Cotabato at around 3.30 p.m. of November 5, 1977. The same story goes, they were killed 
how they were hogtied, killed, chopped into pieces, and eaten. Moderation stated that he was present and had witnessed the abduction and murder of Ali Mamalumpong and Mambawatan Mamalumpong. The same story is uh, what Moderation has said. So what do we make? How do we make sense of this? Uh, how do we make sense of these stories? This is I don't know. Um, this is quite uh, a personal cost to me <laughs> because this was part of my researches. Polumulok has gone a very long way. It is currently dubbed as Mindanao's richest municipality. It has moved on from the memories of the martial law. However, the remnant of the Ilaga among the local population is that they were heroes. On my personal view, they were greatly remembered not on their unspeakable murders, but because of their talismans and amulets. Their supposed invincibility and their violence against the lo local Moros were being justified because the Moros are viewed as traidor or traitors. Allow me to proceed on what I stated earlier as a challenge historical notion. This is the battle we as historians and I as a student of history are battling. We are battling against historical revisionism. We are battling misinformation and we are battling a rising culture of violence enthroned on a Machiavellian cathedral. We will never step foot on the same river twice as the cliche said. The river and the person symbolizing historical circumstances and characters have changed. Yes, Marcos is dead, 1972 has transpired, but the truth, the person still breathing and the rivers running anew. Not an issue if, not an issue of if, but of when. Lastly, I would end my presentation not with the aphorism of Santayana, but the maxim of Twain. History does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Madamo Gidga Salamat, thank you everyone and have a, have a good morning. Thank you. Thank you for your discussion, Mr. Lopez. And now let's proceed with our third and final panelist. Uh, he is from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines in Manila, and he will discuss to us the Naratibo ng Lubi sa ating gunita, ang industriya ng yog sa panitikan at kasaysayang Pilipino, 1940 to 2018. Please help me welcome Dr. Romeo Palustre Peña. Good morning sa lahat. Uh, share ko lang yung aking presentation. Malinaw naman po yung audio ko, Sir Tad. Malinaw naman po. Yes, very clear po, Dr. Peña. Okay po. Uh, magandang umaga po ulit sa lahat. Ako po si uh, Romeo Peña. Uh, mula po sa Center for Social History ng PUP. Ang akin pong uh, tatalakayin ngayon ay uh, nauna ko na po na ito po ay aking disertasyon ito lang 2020 sa PhD Philippine Studies sa UP Diliman. Ito po yung first time na ipipresent ko ito sa public at marami pong salamat sa PHA, sa ICH, uh, CC Southeast Asia sa ganitong pagkakataon para makapag uh, bahagi ng pananaliksi. Ang aking pong title ulit ay Naratibo ng Lubi sa ating gunita ang industriya ng niyog sa panitikan at kasaysayang Pilipino mula 1940 uh, to 2018. Pero may nakatago po itong uh, part. Uh, sinisimulan yung pagbabalik tanaw sa kung ano ba ang uh, kalinangan hinggil sa niyog uh, sa ating mga Pilipino. Uh, Para ayun, medyo nahirapan po kong isummarize sa 20 minutes yung aking presentation pero itatry ko na talagang masunod yung 20 minutes. Okay, yung daloy at laman ng pag-aaral ay hinati sa limang bahagi. Ang pag-aaral po ay kinapapalooban ng pangkalahatang introduction mula sa paglilatag ng paksa hanggang sa mga tuon at limitasyon ng pananaliksi. Yung pangalawang bahagi ay yung pagunita doon sa mga naratibo mula sa mga oral literature mula sa mga bugtong sa Lawikain at Awiting Bayan na naglululan ng mga kaalamang bayan at kalinangang Pilipino hinggil sa nyog sa ating bansa. Yung pangatlong bahagi naman ay may apat na seksyon. Naglalatag ito ng pagunita sa mga naratibong pangkasaysayan na pampanitikan na pumapatungkol sa mga paksa 
nang nakikaugnayan sa industriya niyo mula 1940 hanggang 2018. Samantala, yung pang-apat na bahagi naman ay nakatuon sa pagdalumat mismo kung paano yung mga pagunita na ito sa mga naratibong pangkasaysayan at pampanitikan ay magagamit sa paghubog ng kakanyahan, karangalan at kaakuhan o pagkamamamaya ng mga magninyog sa Pilipinas. At sa huling bahagi ay maghahain ng mga ideya at mga kaalamang bungan doon sa mga pagunita na yon at pagsusuri sa mga naratib na tumutumbok sa halaga ng pagpapatatag ng industriya ng nyog sa hinaharap sa mga aspektong panlipunang identidad, paglikha ng polisiya at pagpapaunlad pang komunidad. Uh, sa pananaliksik na ito ay sinusubukan ko po yung pagsasalikop ng mga naratibong pampanitikan at uh, mga naratibong pangkasaysayan. Bilang paglilatag ng paksa, ako po ay anak ng maglulukad o magkukopar. Ako po ay tubong katanawan, uh, bahagi ng tinatawag na Bundok Peninsula sa Quezon Province. Uh, matagal ko na pong inaaral ito mula ng master's degree. Uh, yung akin pong uh, creative thesis, yung nobela tungkol sa, sa pagkukopra o sa, sa kalinangan sa nyog ay uh, itinuloy ko bilang critical na pagsusuri naman sa PhD. Uh, tinit, uh, yung nakakaalarmang pagbagsak ng presyo ng nyog ang nagtulak lalo sa akin na aralin ito ng gusto. Kahit tinuturing na yung Pilipinas bilang biggest exporter ng coconut oil sa buong mundo, at yung industriya pa rin naman ng nyog ang top agricultural export revenue generator ng Pilipinas. At nangunguna pa rin ng Pilipinas sa produksyon ng kopra sa mundo. At yung pagkakaroon ko ng interest na critical na arali ng sitwasyon ng mga magninyog, maglulukad at industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas, ito rin yung isa sa mga dahilan bakit ko ito inaral. At walang naisulat na kasaysayan simula na magkaroon ng ahensyang tututok sa industriya ng nyog mula noong 1940. Okay. Bilang paglilatang paksa, ito ay pagsasasaysayan ng industriya ng nyo mula 1940 hanggang 2018. Uh, bakit 1940? Uh, maaalala na taong ito, pininsala ng gusto ng mga Amerikano ang industriya ng nyo sa Pilipinas sa pamamagitan ng politikal na pagkontrol, panghihimasok sa industriya. Gumawa sila ng paraan para mapigilan ng tuloy-tuloy na pagunlad nito sa pamamagitan ng pagpapataw ng kota, export tax at excise tax sa mga iniluluwas na mga produktong mula sa nyo sa Pilipinas. Ang mga ipinataw na kota at mga tax ng mga Amerikano ang nagdulot ng pagbagsak ng presyo ng kopra at pagbagsak ng industriya ng nyog na ang pinakamalala ay noong 1940. Samantalang nito rin 2018 na itala yung pinakabagsak na presyo ng nyog mula uh, 1,399 na dolyar tungong 976 dolyar lamang kada metrikong tonelada. At dito nga naglabas yung Philippine Coconut Authority noong 2018 ng pahayag hinggil sa hindi mapigil na pagbagsak ng presyo ng nyo. Pero ang magandang part naman nito, taong 2018 ay dinao sa Pilipinas yung First World Coconut Congress. At bilang pagbabalik tanaw, malinaw na may tala hinggil sa kultura at halaga ng nyo sa sinaunang bayan o sa, sa unang paglalayag pa ikos sa daigdig sa tala na ito ni Antonio Pigapeta. Nung mapadpad siya sa isla ng Samar, nakita niya at naobserbahan kung gaano kahalaga sa mga mamamayan noon ang nyog. Sabi pa nga niya, tumatagal ng isang siglo ang nyog, yung dalawang nyog puno ng nyog ay sumasapa sa pamilya na mayroong hanggang sampung uh, miyembro. Kaya uh, dito pa lang mapapatunayan na natin na noon pa man ay may malaki nang naitutulong sa mga Pilipino ang nyog. Binabanggit din... Uh, ni George Hicks na when Magellan arrived in 1521, he found the islands abundant with coconut trees. At yung kay F.C. Cook, the Philippine trade in copra before, before the Spanish occupation and even throughout the major portion of the Spanish period was largely local. At yung kay Hicks ulit ay the importance of the coconut was recognized at this early stage prior to Spanish rule when the natives obtained part of their sustenance from the tree. Sabihin, marami nagpapatunay na Um, laki na talagang ginagagampanan ng uh, kultura ng pagnyunyog noon pa man. Pero yung pagpwersa ng gobyernong Kastila sa pagpapatangin ng mga puno ng nyog ay may malaking epekto noon. Uh, ito ay kautosang ipinalabas ni Sebastian Hortado de Corcuera noong 1642. At uh, ito yung kaya nagpatanim sila ng marami kasi nangangailangan yung mga Kastila noon ng mga langis at alak at bunot para sa mga galyon at iba pang sasakyang pandagat. Uh, ito, dahil 
hindi naman uh, sabihin natin na hindi naman sa una ay hindi naman nangangailangan na napakarami puno ng nyo. Kaya yung naobserbahan ng mga Kastila na hindi nasusunod yung pagtatanim ng mga ng mga mamamayan ay eh, uh, nagbuli dito na uh, tingnan yung mga Pilipino na at paratangan tamad. Kaya uh, may maling pagtingin hinggil sa sa context uh, pagdating dito at itinala halimbawa nung isang pra- paring ng isang pari na na si Juan Francisco de San Antonio uh, these are all the benefits which the coconut gives the Indian and yet it is necessary to establish a system to get them plant the funds and make certain that so many benefits are not lost because of their laziness ganyan na yung pagtuturing nila pero kung kung tutuusin uh, yung pagkapwersa sa pagpapatanim ng puno ng nyog ay yun lamang yung nagbulid sa mga Pilipino uh, na hindi naman dapat da, dapat sila tawaging mga tamad kasi yung pangangailangan nila doon sa nyog ay sumasapat lang at kaya lang naman uh, nangailangan ng marami dahil ito na nga yung pangangailangan ng mga Kastila. Uh, dito sa sinagot ng pag-aaral na ito, yung mga suliran na ito, paano ginugunita ang mga in- ang industriya ng nyog sa mga naratibo mula sa mga oral na panitikan, sa mga bugtong sa lawikain at mga naratibong pangkasaysayan at pampanitikan mula taong 1940 hanggang 2018 at bakit makatutulong mga pagunitang ito sa pagpapatatag ng industriya ng nyog. At siguro uh, mamaya may isa-isa ko na rin itong mga specific uh, uh, suliranin na nilatag ko dito sa aking pag-aaral. At bilang pagtingin doon sa kahalagahan, binanggit ko na na naglalayon din ito na makatulong kahit papano doon sa pag-aambag sa pagsasakasaysayan ng industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas. At yung mga pagsusuri nga doon sa mga pagunitasan nyog sa mga naratibong pampanitikan uh, mula doon sa mga oral na panitikan at mga naratibong pang kasaysayan. Bilang uh, mga pinagbatayang mga concept at uh, mga theories, ma- maaaring tingnan ito doon sa mga magkakakawing na yung mga ginamit ko na mga ideya ni na Roland Tolentino, uh, Ramon Guillermo, uh, Vicente Villan, Ligop, uh, Berilo Almario, Paul Ricor at Mr. Foucault ang inangklahan ng pananaliksik na ito at naging gabay para matupad ang nabuong balangkas ng pag-aaral na makikita sa diagram 3. Mula sa lente na Tolentino at Guillermo na ang akdang pang kasaysayan ay maaari magbigay liwanag at ang pagsulat ng kasaysayan ay paglikha ng mapa ng kaisipan at pagkilos ng pamayanan tungo sa gampani ng gunita bilang hugutan ng kasaysayan ni Nabilian, Ligo at Almario hanggang sa konsepto ni Narikur at Puko sa pinakamahalagang gampani ng pagsulat ng kasaysayan. Inilangkap ang mga magkakaugnay sa ng mga konseptong ito sa kaso ng industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas. Sa pagtalakay rin sa gamit ng gunitang pangkasaysayan at pangkoon larang gamit ng kasaysayan ni Bilyan, may hinuhuang ang mga maglulukad, magkukopra, magnyunyog, ang pinaka-essential na bahagi ng ginagawang paglingon sa kasalukuyan tungo sa bisyon na matatag na industriya ng nyog sa ating bansa hanggang sa kinaharap. Samantala, yung, uh, ito yung diagram 3 na sinundan ko doon sa pag-aaral mula doon sa pagtingin sa industriya ng nyog uh, titingnan yung kaalamang bayan o mga oral na panitikan at yung mga naratibong pangkasaysayan mula sa mga saliksik, balita, ula, tala, datos, liha, mga pahayag at yung naratibong pangpanitikan mula doon sa mga tula, awit, kwento, nobela, sanaysay at mga pelikula hindi ko na ito may isa-isa doon sa PowerPoint presentation na to dahil uh, kulang yung oras at yung mga oral na kasaysayan nito na ginugunita uh, na may kinalaman sa nyog lukad ang term kasi sa sa amin ng kopra ay lukad paglulukad pagkokopra pag nyog at hanggang sa pag sa pagpasok doon sa pagtingin ng kakanyahan karangalan pagkamamamaya ng mga magkokopra at yung tinitingnan dito yung pagpapatatag ng industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas mula doon sa concept na panlipon ng identidad, paglikha ng polisi at pagpapaunlad pang komunidad. Sa metodolohiya ng pag-aaral, uh, 
pinagugutan dito yung mga pamamaraang pangkasaysayan at pamamaraang pampanitingan sa pagsusuri upang masapulang layunin na madalumat ang mga pagunita sa industriya ng nyog sa mga naratibong pangkasaysayan at pampanitigan at matukoy ang gamit ito sa paghubog ng kakanyahan at karangalan at kaakuhan ng pagkamamayan ng mga magnyog sa Pilipinas. Gayun din nakatulong ng gusto ang kasaysayang pasalita o oral na kasaysayan uh, na ginamit ko mula kay Clement Aquino, Kimel Gabriel, uh, Marcelino Foronda, Fernando Santiago Jr., uh, Marie Luisa Camagay at Gene Sik, bilang met metodong pangkasaysayan na nagamit ang mananaliksik upang itampok ang tinig ng mga magbinog magkuko para maglulukad sa Pilipinas. Taong 2018 na 2019, ito, ito yung panahon po na nag-field work ako sa amin sa Bundok Peninsula. Mas, mas naging madali dahil yung Bundok Peninsula ay ito talaga ay lungga na, na, o nyugan ang kapaligiran at nag, naging mas madali sa akin dahil doon ako nagmula. Ay yung sa unang suliran ni na ano-anong mga naratibo ang maaari magunita na pumapatungkol sa kultura ng pagnyunyog mula sa mga oral na panitikan uh, na naglululan ng mga alamang bayan at kalinangang Pilipino. Dito sinasagot na sa bahaging itit, ito, itinampok ang mga oral na panitikan bugtong sa lawika inatawiting bayan. Uh, mula doon sa paglalatag ng, at pagsusuri gamit ang mga naratibo mula sa mga oral na panitikan Nakatulong ito upang maunawaan at mampalitaw ang kaalamang bayan at kalinangang Pilipino ukol sa nyog na ibinuka sa ating kamalayan. Uh, nagbubunsod ang mga kaalamang bayan at kalinangang ito ng matibay na sandigan sa paglingon at pagunita sa mga dakilang di diwang na kapaloob na may kaugnayan sa nyog. Kung babalikan, si Bilyan, sinabi niyang kailangan pagukulan ng mataas na pagpapahalaga ang paglingon. Kaya makabuluhan sa paglingon o pagunita ang kaalamang bayan at kalinangan upang maangking muli ang kamalang bayan at magamit ito bilang dynamicong sangkap sa pagbabagong panlipunan. Idiniin nga ni Almario, kailangan ang pagunita upang makagawa ng epektibong plano o programa para sa ninanais na pagbabago sa inaharap. Sa mga tweed, yung mga oral na panitikan na sinuri dito, hinggil sa nyog na tinalakay at ginu ginu ginunita ay giya sa pag-angking muli sa sariling kalinangan sa pagninyog at ang kalinangan ito ang higit na kinakailangan uh, pagpaplanon sa pagpaplano ng mga programa upang hindi mahirapan ang, ang industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas na bagtasin ang landas sa hinaharap at makamit nito ang tunay na pagunat. Bilang highlight nito, mapapansin nyo doon sa sinuyod kung uh, yung Philippine Folklore Literature Series ni Damian uh, dito sa mga bugtong, yung pagsuyod ko at pagbilang at yung pagsusuri doon sa mga bugtong na tungkol sa nyog, Uh, tinignan ko na rin kung gaano karami yung bugtong sa nyog uh, at yung iba pang bugtong doon sa mga agricultural na pananim sa Pilipinas. Lumalabas doon sa Philippine Folk Literature Series Volume 5 na The Riddles ni Damiana Eugenio. Napakarami, higit na mas marami ang mga bugtong hinggil sa nyog kaysa sa bugtong hinggil sa abaka, uh, saging, uh, sa mais, cotton, pineapple, kahit sa kahit sa ano sa rice. Talagang uh, dito makikita na maaring tingnan na um, uh, binibigyan to na dati pa ang nyo bilang parte na ng uh, tawag dito ng pamumuhay ng mga mamamayan. At doon sa suliranin Number two, ay yung naratibong pangkasaysayan uh, na may kinalaman naman sa sa nyog, sa industry ng nyog sa bansa mula taong 1940 hanggang 2018. Dito ko hinati yung apat na section para may, may pakita na rin yung uh, periodization kahit pa paano. Dito sa unang section, uh, pinamagatan ko itong mga naratibo ng pagkabigo ng nyog at pagwawaglit sa katutubong tradisyon mula 1940 hanggang 1953. Inilatag yung pagsasalikop ng mga naratibo hinggil sa nyog na mababaka sa pagunita sa mga talampang kasaysayan na talampang panitika. Nagsimula ito sa pagtalakay sa paglitaw ng isang korporasyon ng gobyerno ng Pilipinas na naitatag sa layuning maisulong daw ang nagsasariling industriya ng nyog sa bansa. Ito ang National Coconut Corporation. 
dito inilantad ang mga datos, tala, ulat at saliksik bilang mga naratibong pangkasisayan na nagpatunay na sa mahabang panahon ay higit na napakinabangan ng mga Amerikano ang industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas. Dahil nakita ng mga Amerikano na matindi ang pag-unlad ng industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas, gumawa sila ng paraan para mapigilan ng tuloy-tuloy na pag-unlad nito sa pamagitan ng binabanggit ko na sa umpisa at sa mga inilulugas na produkto mula sa nyog sa Pilipinas. Kasalikop ng pag-unita, sa akin na hinatna ng industriya ng nyog sa panahong ito, ang pag-unita sa dalawang nagsalpukang personalidad na umalingangaw ang pangalan ng takda sa parehong panahon. Sila ay sina Jose Garcia Villa at Salvador Lopez. Ang unang personalidad ay aakalain na malilingon sana ang akda niyang The Coconut Poem bilang testamento ng pagpapahalaga sa inyo. Samantala, ang pangalawa ay inaasahan sana makapaghain ng pagtalakay sa tinatawag na panitik ang proletaryo na may diwang sumasalok sa sariling kalinangan sa pamamagitan sa pag, ng pagunita sa kapwa Pilipino sa kasaysayan na akmang ibabandi lang ang akda dahil ang kop ang konsepto sa kanyang paksang proletarian literature. Ngunit patutuklasan sa ginawang pagsusuri na ang dalawang nagsalpukang personalidad ay hindi kayang kilalani ng mga sarili at nagpapaligsahan lamang ng mga nasagap nila mga Amerikanong himig at banyagang tradisyon sa panitikan. Kaya bigurin sila sa paghahain ng mga naratibong magugunita. Sana hinggil sa nyog at mga magsasaka magninyog proletaryo sa ating bansa. Sa seksyong ito ng pag-aaral, masusumpungan ng mga naratibong pangkasaysayan at pampanitikang hinggil sa nyog na tila nagiging lason kung susundan natin ang pagsandig ni Paul Ricoeur sa parmako ni Plato. Lason dahil sa halip na kumatawan ang mga naratibong ito sa sariling kalinangan sa nyog at pagtalakay mismo sa mga magsasakang Pilipino, nawalan ito ng kapasidad sa pagkatligaw rin at hindi angkop sa sariling karanasan ang mga nasagap nilang kamalayan. Samantala doon sa pangalawang seksyon, mga naratibo ng pagluha at pagkawala ang ngunit pagtayog ng nyog sa saliksik at awit. 1954 to 1972. Sa pangalawang seksyon na ito, tinala kayo naging sitwasyon ng industriya ng nyo gamit ang mga naratibong pangkasaysayan at pampanitikan. Sa klaw ng panahong ito, ang mga naratibo ng pagkatata, uh, pagkakatatag ng tatlong ahensya ng pamahalaan na nilikharaw para sa pangangailangan ng industriya ng nyo sa ating bansa. Ang mga ahensya ito ay ang Philippine Coconut Administration, yung PILCOA, Philippine Coconut Research Institute, PILCORIN, at Coconut Coordinating Council. Sa tatlong ito, ang PILCORIN na CCC ang may malinaw na mga nagawa para paunla rin ang produksyon ng nyog, lalo na sa bahaging Mindanao. Gayun din, inilatag sa bahaging ito ang lumaganap na material na panturo o textbook sa pag-aaral ng panitikan na saklaw pa rin ng panahong ito sa pampublikong edukasyon sa ating bansa. Mula sa pagsusuri sa apat na tomo ng Philippine Prose and Poetry, walang tungkol sa nyog o kahit tungkol sa agrikultura man lamang sa pangkabuuan ang material na panturong ito. Kaya hindi maaasahang mapatingkad ang kamalayang Pilipino, lalo na ang kamalayang pang-agrikultura sa pampublikong edukasyon noon dahil sa ganitong klase ng mga material na panturo o textbook. Ngunit sa panahong ito na itampok naman sa pamamagitan ng mga saliksik ni E. Arsenio Manuel, ang masusing pag-aaral sa mga terminong ginagamit kaugnay sa kultura ng pagninyog sa Pilipinas, partikular sa lalawigan ng Quezon, na maituturing na mahalaga hindi lamang sa industriya ng nyog, kundi pati na rin sa banggit na lalawigan. Dito na rin nagsimulang matunghayan ang tinig ng mga nakapanayamsan at nakakwentuhan kong mga magninyog mula sa aming lugar sa bundok peninsula, particular sa mga bayan ng Buena Vista, San Narciso at Mulanay. Hinggil sa mga usaping may kinalaman sa mahabang panahon ng pangangamuhan sa nyugan, reformang agraryo, presyo ng nyug, estado ng pamumuhay bilang magninyog, at pati na rin sa usapin ng kultura sa pagninyog, particular ang mga terminong ginagamit sa pagninyog sa bundok peninsula. Mula sa mga ganitong naratibong nagmumula sa pagunita ng mga mismong mga magninyog sa pamayanan, napatitingkad ang ideyang binitawan ni Ligop hinggil sa pagpapahalaga sa bunita upang maging batis pang kasaysayan na kumakalinga sa mismong pamayanan upang magsilbing mainam na batayan ng nakalipas at magsilbing gabay sa pag-unawa sa kasalukuyan at hinaharap. Sa makatwid ang mga naratibong mula mismo sa pagunita ng mga magninyog ay nararapat pahalagahan upang maging batayan ng nakaraan at makatulong sa pagsipat sa kasalukuyan at hinaharap ng industriya ng nyog sa ating bansa. Sa pangatlong seksyon naman, mga naratibo ng pagmumunopolyo, pagkontrol at anomalya sa industriya ng nyog sa kasaysayan at ang pamumunga ng nyog sa panitikan noong 1972 hanggang 1987. Sa pangatlong seksyon na ito, inilatag ang mga naging kalagayan ng industriya ng nyog sa panahon ng batas militar. Unang inilatag ang estado ng industriya ng nyog pagdating sa pagluluwas o export sa panahong iyon. Makikita 
sa pamamagitan ng mga datos na nananatili malakas at nangunguna pa rin ng Pilipinas sa pagluluwas ng mga produktong mula sa nyug. Tuloy-tuloy itong nakapag-ambag ng malaking kita at nakatulong sa ekonomiya ng bansa. Subalit sa panahon ding ito, naganap ang matinding pagmumonopolyo at pagkontrol sa industry ng nyug ng pangkating Marcos, Enrile at Cuanco gamit ang mga institusyon sila rin mismo ang lumika gaya ng PCA, Unicom, UCPB at COCOFED. Sa panahon ring ito, ipinatawang ang coconut levy na ugat ng maraming ano, uh, anomalya at kontrobersya sa industriya ng nyog na lalong nagpalugmok sa kalagayan ng mga magninyog sa ating bansa. Dagdag pa ang hindi matagumpay na reformang agraryong na, nagpatindi sa, ng paghihirap ng mga magsasaka. Kasalikop ng mga pangyayaring ito ang pagkasangkapan sa mga panitikang hinggil sa nyog upang isulong ang diskurso ng bagong lipunan ng Administrasyong Marcos. Ang mga limbawa ay ang paggamit ng panitikang hinggil sa nyog sa pagsusulong ng Green Revolution, wastong nutrisyon at reformang agraryo na bahagi ng programang bagong lipunan. Sa kabilang banda, inihain din sa bahaging ito ang pagunita mula sa tinig, akda at mga pahayag bilang pagtuligsa at kontradiskurso sa mga ipinalaganap at pinamayaning diskurso sa panahon ng batas militar, lalo na hinggil sa usapin ng coconut lead fund. Ang mga gunitang ito ay mula mismo sa tinig, akda at mga pahayag ng mga organisasyon ng mga magninyog at lihitimong mga magninyog sa ating bansa nagsilbing kontra kasaysayan sa namayani at nilikang opisyal na kasaysayan na ipinagugunita ng mga diskursong umaayon noon sa bagong lipunan. Sangayon nga kay Foucault, ang mga kontrang kasaysayan at kontradiskursong ito ay mula sa mga taong isinadlak sa dilim at tinanggalan ng tinig. Kaya kontra kasaysayan ito ay kasaysayan ng kaapihan at hindi kasaysayan ng pagtatagumpay ngunit gamot upang mapasilang ang katotohanan. Ngunit kahit ang kasaysayan ito ay nagawang patahimikin ng mga opisyal na kasaysayan, ito ang kasaysayan nagpapatunay na may naganap na omisyon at eksklusyon dahil may mga pinipi at tinanggalan ng tinig sa pamamagitan ng diskursibong praktika sa isang partikular na espasyo at panahon. Sa mga katwid, ang tinig, akda, at mga kaya ng mga magdunyog na inilatag sa bahaging ito na taliwas o kontra sa mga namayaning diskursong na itala noon sa opisyal na kasaysayan na pumapatungkol sa industriya ng nyog ay katunayan na may naganap na omisyon at eksklusyon sa tinig ng mga magdunyog noon. Pinipi at inapi sila sa panahong iyon at hindi pinakinggan ang kanilang tinig lalo na sa malaganap na issue ng coconut levy at matinding pagmumonopolyo at pagkontrol sa industry ng nyog sa mga, ng mga gahaman at mga nasa kapangyarihan kaya lalo silang nalugmok sa kahirapan. Sa pang-apat naman na seksyon, mga naratibo ng panghinayang at pagkabahala sa kalagayan ng industry ng nyog at ang ani ng nyog sa panitikan, ito yung pinakahuling seksyon. Uh, inilatag dito, ito yung panahong hindi pa rin binigo ng mga magninyog na Pilipino ang bansa pagdating sa tuloy-tuloy na produksyon ng nyog at pagluluwas ng mga produktong nagmumula sa nyog sa buong mundo. Sa kabila ng pam- pamamagpag ng mga bansa sa mundo sa industry ng nyog, gagaya halimbawa ng Indonesia, na natili ang mga magninyog sa kanilang katungkulan na maging bahagi ng pagpupunyagi at pag-asam sa- ng bansang may maunlad na yamang agrikultural. Subalit na natiling bigo ang mga magninyog sapagkat hindi na isa katuparan ng mga ipinangakong reformang agraryo dahil may ituturing na buktot na pagkatao ng mga may-ari ng malalawak na nyugan, mayroong mga may-aring na nanakot sa mga magninyog, mayroong hindi tumugon sa petisyon na isama sa reformang agraryo ang kanilang lupain o mga sakim. Mayroong nagpalayas at nang api sa mga magninyog na nasa kanilang lupain o masasama ang pag-uugali at mayroon nakakakuha ng eksklusyon para sa reformang agraryo sa dar dahil sa paglalagay o mga magugulang at mga mandaraya. Dagdag pa, talagang naging malig- malaking dagok sa mga magsasaka ang hindi tunay na reformang agraryo dahil ang mismong pamilya o ang kanang administrasyong Aquino noon ang lumabag dito kung babalikan ang isyo ng Hacienda Luisita. Ang nagpapagunita ang mga datos pang kasaysayan sa yugtong ito ng mga naratibo ng panghinayang at pagka- sa kabila ng pagpagal ng mga magninyog para matugunan ng export-oriented na katangian ng paglago ng industriya ng nyog sa Pilipinas, nananatiling hikahos pa rin ang kalagayan ng mga magninyog. Bigo sila sa magandang kita sa pagninyog, bigo sa suporta ng gobyerno at bigo rin sa reformang agraryo. Tumagos ang pagkabigong ito ng mga magninyog sa mga sumunod pang administrasyon hanggang mabalitaan natin ang pagbagsak ng presyo ng nyog na pinakamababa sa kasaysayan noong 2018. Nasa panahon ring ito ang mga naratibong pangkasaysayan hinggil sa pananalasa ng pesteng kokolisap 
na puminsala sa 2.1 milyong puno ng nyog sa Pilipinas sa kabilang banda naging matayog naman ang pagunita sa industriya ng, ng nyog sa panong ito sa pamamagitan ng mga naratibong pampanitikan. Inilatag rito ang tula ni Landicho na humatak para mabalikan ang isyo ng pagpapagawa ng tahanang Pilipino o mas kilala bilang coconut palace. Ang tula naman ni Asenho ay naglatag ng senaryo upang makilala ang isa pang umuusbong na industriyang may kinalaman sa nyog. Ito ang coconut water industry. Samantala ang tula naman ni at buhingin mga napagsamantahan at inaping mga magninyog ng mga nasa kapangyarihan, mga gahaman at mga mandarambong na kung babalikan at sisipatin sa daloy ng kasaysayan ng industriya ng nyog ay mapatutunayang totoo lalo na sa panahon ng batas militar. Sa mga sanaysay naman ni Nina Almario at Bim Nadera, ipinamalas ang hindi pangkaraniwang pagdakila sa nyog na nakapagmumulat ng kaisipan ng mga Pilipino hinggil sa halaga ng nyog sa ating buhay at sa lipo ng ating ginagalawa ng awit ng mga coconut na, na komposisyon ni ng pambansang alagad ng sining na si Ryan Kayabyab na naglalarawan ng saysay at gamit ng bawat bahagi ng puno ng nyog ang pumukaw sa atensyon ng buong mundo at naging hugutan upang matalakay ang naidulot na multi-industry na, na inaidudulot ng nyog sa ating bansa. Ang piliko ng dokumentaryong hinggil sa isyo ng Coco Levin na kinarikariringga natin ng Inig mga babaeng magnunyog ang nagtulak naman para masuri ang kalagayan ng kababaihang magnunyog sa lipunang Pilipino. At ang mga tula ng mga magnunyog sa bundok peninsula na inilatag ko din dito ay nagbibitbit ng isyu hinggil sa suporta ng gobyerno sa mga magnunyog at isyu ng tumatandang populasyon o aging population ng mga magnunyog sa ating bansa. At para ma-skip na siguro yan dahil nandun na rin yan sa aking uh, conclusion, Uh, ito yung mga ideya at kaalamang bunga ng pagunita sa mga naratibo tungkol sa pagpapatatag ng industriya ng nyog sa mga aspektong panlipunang identidad, paglikha ng polisiya at mga pagpapaunlad pang komunidad. Binibigyang diin ng mga aspektong ito ang kahalagahan ng reformang agrary at wastong pagpapatupad nito. Pagalatag ng akmang polisiya at batas para maibalik sa mga magninyog ang pondong mula sa Coco Levy sa pamagitan ng pagtatatag ng Coconut Farmers Trust Fund pagpapatupad ng malawakan at integratibong pulisi at plano para sa sapat na tulong pinansyal, benepisyo, paukulang serbisyo at insentibo para sa mga magninyog at makabuluhang reformang nakasentro sa kapakanansanan ng mga magninyog sa mga ahensya ng gobyerno gaya ng PCADA at DAR na nakasasaklaw sa industriya ng nyog. Pagkilala sa lihitimong organisasyong pangmagninyog sa bansa na makatutulong sa pagbuo ng mga makabuluhang pulisi at programa sa pagninyog at pagpapalakas ng programang pampananaliksik hinggil sa nyog na kinabibilangan mismo ng mga lehitimong magninyog at mga mananaliksik hinggil sa nyog. At yung mabilitan at sistematong pagtugon sa mga suliran hinggil sa industriya ng nyog gaya ng sumusunod, yung pesteng dumadapo sa nyog, kakulangan ng kagamitan sa pagninyog, kakulangan sa mga infrastrukturang teknolohikal na kailangan ng industriya, epekto ng pananalantahan ng bagyo, lalo na sa mga inaapektuhan ng mga nyugan, pagtanda o pagulang ng mga puno ng nyug at mga magninyog sa bansa at laganap na konbersyon ng nyugan patungo komersyal na lugar. Bilang konklusyon, sa ginawang pananaliksik, naipakita na ang mga pagunita dahil ito ay sort of summary na noong, noong disertasyon ko na binabanggit ko. Uh, naipakita na ang pagunita sa industriya ng nyug ay nakakawing sa diwang idiniin ni Roland Dolentino na Nakabatay sa naratibo mismo ang konsepto ng kasaysayan, ang paglika ng salaysay, sanaysay o saysay ng pamayanan. Sa, sa, sa pag-aaral na ito, pinalutang ang silbi ng naratibo sa pagsulat ng kasaysayan ng industri ng nyog dahil pinahalagahan na ang kasaysayang ito ay mga kwentong kinata tungkol sa nyog at magdunyog gamit ang obserbasyon, imahinasyon at kritikal na pagsusuri sa kaganapan sa industri ng ito at mga taong nakapaloob rito batay sa pinanggagalingang historical na posisyon. Mula sa isinagawang pagsusuri sa mga naging pagunita sa nyog, sa mga naratibong mula sa oral na panitikan at sa mga naratibong pangkasaysayan at pampanitikan mula sa taong 1940 hanggang 2018, natuklasan sa pag-aaral na ito ang mga ideya at kaalaman na maaaring maging tungtungan sa pagpapatatag ng industriya ng nyog sa inaharap. Gayun din, nasiyasat at naitampok sa pag-aaral na ito ang halaga ng mga maglulukad, mangyunyog, magkukopra sa Pilipinas, partikular na nadukal ang kanilang malaking gampanin sa pagpapayabong ng nyog bilang puno ng buhay at ang gampanin nila sa pagpapaunlad ng industriya ng nyog na maituturing na kadluan ng yaman 
ng ating bansa. Bilang pangwakas, maaaring sa kasunod na pag-aaral nito, hinggil sa industriya ng nyog, na posibleng ianak pa ng pag-aaral na ito o pwedeng pangsuungin ng ibang mananaliksik, ay po pwedeng nakatutok sa industriya ng nyog sa larangan ng arkitektura, engineering, interior design, visual na sining, pagkain, o at iba pa. At maaari din sa industry ng nyog na umuugnay sa kalusugan at medisina. Lalo na sa panahong tinatapos ko, tinatapos ko ito noong bandang March, uh, na isulit itong disertasyon na ito, ay dito pilaganap yung pandemya nga nitong COVID-19 hanggang sa kasalukuyan na nakaapekto hindi lamang sa Pilipinas kundi sa buong mundo. Kaya tinitingnan at pinag-aaralan virgin coconut oil na posibleng makatutulong bilang luna sa COVID-19. Ano pat sa dami ng paksa ng pag-aaral na maaaring ikabit o iugnay sa nyog, pinatutunayan lamang nito ang pagiging puno ng buhay at anumang maranasan at maging sitwasyon ng mundo, laging nariyan ng nyog upang patunayan na, ang, na ito'y papagbigay buhay. Gaya ng nakatala sa nobela ni Rizal, na ang punong nyog na hitik sa bunga, katulad ng mapagbigay buhay na si Astarte o ni Diana ng Epesus na maraming suso. Marami pong salamat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pena, for your presentation. Uh, and now, I would just have uh, a few more minutes left uh, for this panel so we can only accommodate a few questions, uh, one or two questions. Um, we have received questions here, so I'll read those questions that were sent in advance. Um, this question goes to Mr. Atienza. Do you agree with the practices of some filmmakers of stretching, distorting some historical facts and putting some fancy stories, if not intriguing issues, for the sake of entertainment and catching more viewers and capitalizing that particular story in our history? Uh, this is from Mr. Jerick Albella from UST. Mr. Atienza? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, I would like to answer that in quoting Rosenstone, wherein he stated that in undertaking the study of history films, we must first uh, know the nature of the film. And the nature of the film is, uh, it is uh, a medium that always incorporates several filming conventions. And those conventions like uh, fan stories, inventions, are, are the things that uh, we can uh, make sense in order uh, for the better understanding of history. So uh, these uh, errors, these distortions, these historical inaccuracies serve as, uh, serve as an uh, avenues for historical discussions wherein the public and the historian can actively engage with. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question still from Mr. Jerick Albella from the UST for Dr. Pena. Base sa iyong pagsasaliksik, naging mas epektibo ba ang Philcoa or PCA sa kanilang trabaho nang sila ay naging bahagi ng Department of Agriculture? Mas dadagdagan ba ang pondo nito upang mas magkaroon pa ng malawak na pagsasaliksik upang mapalawig ang siyentipikong pag-aaral sa mga niyog sa buong kapuluan. Okay. Um, mula doon sa uh, pinresent ko kanina, um, mag halos magkakapanabayan ano yun, uh, yung Pilkowa, yung unang version, yung Pilkowa dati, uh, kasabay niya yung Pilko rin at saka yung CCC. Mapapansin noong time na yon mas uh, nakatulong talaga pa ng husto yung Pilko rin kasi mas nakatutok yun sa research and development ng, ng coconut industry lalo na sa parte ng Mindanao at saka yung Coconut Coordinating Council. Yung, yung Pilko na naging PC, PCA ngayon, mas lalo pang uh, sabihin natin na humina yung, ano, yung, yung pagtulong halimbawa nito pagdating doon sa uh, research and development pagdating sa coconut industry sa kasalukuyang panahon. Nung na uh, tawag dito, naidikit pa siya lalo doon sa Department of Agriculture kaysa doon sa Hiwalay. Pero ang pinaka, ano nito, uh, mas naging masalimuot pa nga yata yung, ano, yung sitwasyon ng coconut industry sa Pilipinas. Simula nung nagtatag ng National Coconut Corporation noong 1940. Yun yung, yun yung masasabi ko kasi yung bago dumating yung National Coconut Corporation, 
halos uh, ano eh halo, wala pa y- yung National Coconut Corporation kasi yung unang ano talaga eh yung official na ahensya para sa coconut industry sa Pilipinas pero bago yun mapapansin na mas mas ano mas maulad at mas malaganap yung pag-unlad ng mga ano mga magnyog noon bago yung isang particular na ahensya ng gobyerno na yun maraming salamat thank you po Dr. Peña Um, another question here posed in our chat box to Mr. Atienza. Uh, I want to commend your effort in viewing the films you mentioned in your presentation and how you pointed out essential details in the movies. There will always be historical inaccuracies in the movies. What do you think is the best way to learn history from these materials? This is from uh, Ms. Arlene Calara. Okay, uh, thank you again for the question. So, uh, like what I stated earlier, it is uh, the main points that can uh, that can be used to the betterment of to the better understanding of history are the historical errors or the historical uh, distortions in the films. For example, uh, uh, the film Elcano and Magellan had presented uh, uh, the an invalid way in our perspective of the representation of Lapu-Lapu. So from there, it uh, it birthed several historical discussions from the public itself. And another example can be the one uh, during the film viewing of General Luna, wherein the public uh, was curious about the condition of Mabini, uh, wherein the, the public uh, uh, questioned why is Mabini sitting in the entirety of the film? And, and and no one remembers what is the condition of our national hero. So from there, it uh, it can serve as an avenue, and it is the best way. Uh, uh, the film is the best way, uh, since it is a public consumption, in uh, serving as an avenue with the historian and the public engaging uh, actively in the historical discussion. Thank you, Mr. Atienza. Um, I'd like to read just a few comments here. Um, the paper on Ilaga is a significant contribution to martial law studies. Uh, that it was disseminated here in the conference is already a great step to include this in the discourse. And then another said, I agree the Ilaga paper could be a great contribution in studying martial law of Marcus. Um, any other questions? Perhaps we can accommodate one more question before we end this panel. Okay, I guess since um, we're not getting any more questions for our panelists, uh, I'd like to thank again our speakers Mr. Atienza, Mr. Lopez, and Dr. Peña for this morning's first uh, panel. And for all the participants, uh, please watch the other panels for the rest of the day. Thank you.
Hello. Good morning, everyone. Oh. Am I live now? Yes. yes, we can hear you. We can see you. Okay, thank you. Um, before anything else, my name is Kent Brian Daug. I will be the moderator for Panel 5, um, the Dutch in Southeast Asia. I am an MA history student from University of San Carlos. Now, before anything else, as a reminder, you may ask questions by pressing the raise hand buttons during the open forum and may also type your questions in the chat box or Q&A box. So without further ado, let's go to the first presentation. So the speech is entitled, Love Alone is Not Enough, Interrogating VOC Treaties and Agreements in Malabar and Southeast Asia from 1662 to 1718. The presenter is from Sri Sankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, Kerala, India. Ladies and gentlemen, our presenter, Ms. Mino Rebecca Mathai. A round of Uh, is it possible to, like, it's not possible to make my video on. It says that the host stopped it. Hello, am I audible? Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Mino, you are audible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have shared the, um, my PowerPoint to a professor. Like, I hope he will share it for me. The PowerPoint is on the screen now. Okay. Hello. Miss Bino, you're clear. You may start. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Hello. I cannot see my PowerPoint. That's why I was wondering. I cannot see this PowerPoint. You have to start sharing it. Oh, uh, your line is a bit choppy Hello? now. Oh. I I'll fix. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so let's uh, give a few minutes for the um, presenter since there's a little bit of a problem. Okay, okay. Uh, hello, is it okay now? Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry for the delay. Uh, there was a connectivity issue in between. Sorry. Uh, no problem. Sincere apologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, and okay, uh, very good morning. Uh, I am Meenu Rebecca from the Department of History. 
Shishangarajari University of Sanskrit, India. So today I'll be talking to you about the Dutch political money was in its possessions. So before going to the paper, I would like to thank all the organizers of this conference, especially International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation Southeast Asia, then uh, Philippines, uh, Malaysian and Indonesian historical associations, and all the other organizations and universities involved in this conference. You people are the backbone of this, uh, this conference. So I'm extremely happy to be a part of this, this conference. You know, coming from India, that is South Asia, South Asia. I'm extremely happy that even I am a part of the Southeast Asian fraternity. You know, it's always been connected in the past and even in the present moment as well. Uh, so I'm a bit happy about that matter. Uh, and I, I think, yeah, now I can move to my PowerPoint. Yeah, it's already visible. Uh, and thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, and uh, all the organizers for sharing me the screen. Um, okay, can you move to the second slide? Second slide, the map. Yes, thanks a lot. So today I'll be talking to you about the Dutch political money was in its possessions in Southeast Asia and in Malabar, which is actually a coastal region situated in the west coast of India. This is actually the map of Malabar. It's a coastal region. So I'm using treaties which were concluded between Dutch East India Company and local rulers as a medium to understand the nature of Dutch East India Company in its possessions. Uh, and the framework that I've used is uh, connected history postulated by Sanjay Subramanian. Uh, you know, this particular framework helped me to transcend the boundaries and, and locate a region in the larger politics of Dutch treaty making. So if we flip through the previous literature, you know, we or see historians often perceived Dutch in their company in, in, uh, through different lenses. And when I understood, uh, when I read through all this, uh, this uh, literature, I have come across some trends. So I'm uh, actually planning to share it with you. Uh, the first trend that I've uh, came across is the often traditional trend of uh, seeing company, that is India company as a corporate trading company uh, engaged only in export and import for profit. This is the traditional way of uh, perceiving that is India company. And against this trend, many of the historians later, they connected political activities with economic activities. And uh, the current historians like Eddie, Eric Odegaard and uh, all, they even called it as a company state. And again, few of the historians like Marx Wing, uh, they brought about the emporialistic nature of the VOC. Uh, emporialist nature means they were arguing that uh, Dutch East India Company in Asia can be propped through the lens of emporialism only. It means, you know, the markers or the emporia were the targets of European seaborne entities and not territory per se. And any territory acquired helped only to subserve the economic advantages. This is actually uh, uh, the term, the terminology emporialism meant. Um, can you go to the third slide? Yes, so this is the larger, these are the larger arguments of my paper. And I would like to argue that, you know, VOC had pursued, that means the Dutch East India Company had pursued a definite way of empire building throughout its territories. I mean, throughout its possession, Southeast Asia and South Asia, whether it's Indonesia in Southeast Asia or Malabar in South Asia. And they used treaties uh, for empire building. And I would like to argue that it was a company by treaty. It was a company by treaty uh, as it had outright empire interest and engaged in complex state-like activities. Uh, so the treaties shows kind of homogeneity, kind of homogeneity, similarities, and they were connected throughout its possession. So this is uh, purely Dutch colonialism and not commercial per se. So these are the larger arguments of my paper, and I'm trying to prove my arguments through a critical analysis of treaties by juxtaposing treaties in Malabar and Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, coming to the fourth slide, You know, uh, this is Salang, Sun and Mandua, Phrases and Ember. So through this particular uh, point, I'm trying to argue that the local phrases were adapted or adopted by the Dutch East India Company while making their treaties. And uh, they have used these phrases for uh, the Ember building. This is the argument of this particular uh, point. Uh, so I'm arguing that the local phrases were used by the Dutch East India Company consciously for empire building. You know, this particular phrase, as long as the sun and moon are in the sky, 
is actually a phrase frequently seen in the Dutch treaties in Southeast Asia and South India, that is in uh, Malabar, both in Malabar and Coromandel Coast. In English, it is called as long as the sun and moon last, or as long as the sun and moon exist. When it comes to Dutch, it is Salang Sun and Mandua. It's in Dutch. And when it comes to Mal Malabar and in when it comes to uh, Coromandel, uh, in Malayalam, it is called that is in South Indian language, it's called Agitinum Chandiranum Ulamal. It's a Malayalam language, uh, which actually means uh, uh, as long as the sun and moon last. So it's seen that this particular phrase has been variously rendered in Malabar, Coromandel, then Palembang, it's in South Indonesia, then Johor in Malaysia. So apart from these places, I haven't come across this particular phrase uh, used by the Dutch East India Company. It's actually uh, seen only in these four uh, places when I uh, went to the Corpus Diplomatic, and that means the, all the treaties uh, concluded between Dutch East India Company and local rulers uh, in its possessions. So what I understood is that uh, by romanticizing the introductory part of the treaties with phrases projecting few rhetoric carrying values, like friendship and attachment and cooperation and all these things. You know, we all see agreements during the initial stages. I'm just reiterating this. We all see agreements during the initial stages in Southeast Asia and South India, not in the North India, South India, in Malabar and Coromandel. It expected mutual understanding, then friendship and attachment and cooperation. But when we look in between the lines, when we first, uh, understand in between the lines, when we go through the lines or a closer look on the treaties and events followed is enough to understand that there have been deceit. So I argue that the cultural features of each region influence Dutch treaty making. And you know these phrases were used as a sign, as a signal or a sign to control the psyche of the natives. Uh, because you know this particular phrase, as long as the sun and moon, Moon last. It has its roots from Sanskrit. I have gone through some of the epigraphical sources and I understood that this particular phrase has been used uh, from third century onwards. So it has a kind of you know roots from Sanskrit. So basically, Sanskrit, this particular language has been used by the Dutch to control the psyche of the native for their larger ambitions. So, you know, so this is the you know uh, the argument. Uh, this is what I understood. You know, the phrases and ember is largely connected. Uh, can you go to the fifth slide, please? Yes. Uh, so I am just uh, uh, showing you some examples. In Palais Bangits in Indonesia, it's agreed that uh, agreed to maintain mutual friendship as long as the sun and moon shine and uh, the day lasts. Uh, through the treatise uh, written on 3rd July 1678 and 19 May 1681. And the same has been rendered in Johor too on 6th April 1685. And when it comes to the Indian regions like Malabar and Coromandel, it's written as as long as the sun and moon last, and sometimes they have added earth to it. And uh, I will show you one example in the in the treaty with Raja of Cochin, which was Cochin is in Malabar in South India. So in the treaty with Raja of Cochin signed in 28th March, it's written as Bumi Ullanalum, Rajaum, Ulanda Kambanyim, Anyonim, Sneho, Vishwastadim. It's actually a Malayalam language, Malayalam. Uh, so I will translate it for you. It means that Raja and company, that means the king, Raja means king, king and the company will maintain eternal friendship, faith and love as long as the earth exists. So there is actually homogeneity in phrases in the treaties in Southeast, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, countries like Indonesia, Johor, and in South Asian countries like Malabar and Coromandel. And it says that the Dutch used phrases as a way to control the psyche of the native rulers and the natives as well. So the local phrases were used consciously by the colonizers for embed building. Uh, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, apart from this, uh, this particular phrase, as long as the sun and moon last, you know, Dutch made treaties in each region with regard to the customs and culture of the particular place. So if eternal friendship was guaranteed in Cochin through the phrase, as long as the sun and moon exist, or as long as the earth lasts, you know, the treaties of Dutch with Sulawesi is not the same. It's more like chalk and cheese. It's more like chalk and cheese. When it comes to, when it comes to Sulawesi, you know, Dutch used various phrases like, we are the brothers, equally great, with none above and none below. 
we are the slaves only to devte we will not force one to submit to the other we will work together with arms singing freely equal in working equal in sitting uh so quite obviously you know these phrases reflects an urge for eternal friendship but you know the political nuances lying behind this gentle and gracious words cannot be shelved in papers you know these were actually primarily used as a route to the political and commercial benefits uh can you go to the next slide seventh one oh thanks a lot so uh the next apart from these phrases the next argument or the when i you know uh juxtap when i was just juxtaposing when i was reading through the uh, corpus diplomaticum that is the uh, treatise uh, concluded by the east india company uh, with the local rulers i came to understand that there are a lot of similarities in uh, dutch treaties in its possession so this is in south asia so the next uh, similarity that i've came across is uh, the cross cultural trading strategy i would like to call it as cross cultural trading strategy uh you know it's i have actually seen that the company established a genuine monopoly over nutmeg and cloves in its various possessions like ambon then malukas and banda by regulating its production on getting orders from amsterdam and directed its soldiers to cut down the trees on it on the shores to to lessen the supply uh, and it's quite interesting to learn that this particular cross cultural trading strategy of the company can be seen seen even in uh, in in south india and malabar particularly in malabar i was ac actually focusing on malabar so i came across this particular strategy in malabar also uh, so there is a homogeneity you know uh, in the treaty signed between the aja of cochin and 72 madambis uh, madambis means ruling houses 72 madambis of karapuram on 6th april 1710 it was executed on the executed in the presence of dutch commander and it agreed that no tobacco shall hereafter be cultivated in karapuram so if any of the above terms are violated they subject themselves to punishments prescribed by the laws of the country so what i understood is that you know the dutch indian company used their regulatory mechanism for safeguarding the opium monopoly in malabar and you know punishments were also given to those who uh, those who broke the con contract so apparently uh, the treaties were used to say devise to implement these strategies and uh, there was a homogeneity in homogeneity when it comes to the treaty making politics of the dutch east india company in south east asia and malabar that means in south india as well uh, can you go to the next slide eight one yes so the apart from these two points the next uh, similarity that i have come across is that the treaties were a reciprocal agreement these were a reciprocal agreement that means it compared antagonism with commerce this particular feature actually typified uh, the dutch treaty making in south east asia and malabar you know these were actually defensive alliances and the trading alliances that offered military protection in return uh, and, and again in return dutch received enormous trading privileges so treaties were obviously an apparatus to expand dutch colonial and commercial supremacy and um, you know this particular approach this uh, particular feature was visible in many of the dutch possession for example i will show you one example so if we take uh, the case of king of candy a request for support against portuguese uh, came from the king of candy, candy in 1612 for which the monopoly of trade in cinnamon of the ender island was guaranteed again uh, the treaty of uh, dutch with cochin in 1663 it can also be regarded as a replica of the treaty of king of candy signed on 11th may 1612 as it has more or less a similar demands and request you know uh, i i will take one close and see uh, if we take the third clause of this particular treaty signed with cochin cochin king in 1663 you know it was a defensive alliance against the portuguese and it extended protection as well uh, as per the clause it's agreed that if the portuguese insults the king the heron states and would be able to help him in most powerful way so besides king allow them to build a fort protect the ships and agree to supply them with best cinnamon that the country produces and um, i have few more examples but there is a time limit so uh, i'm just again that as a paper of power this state is extended protection arms and ammunition to the ruler and his country with whom the contract was signed besides the company regarded themselves as the guardian and protector of the country 
and these were you know definitely a route to strengthen their foothold in the land and uh, these were actually a uh, uh, a, 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 um, uh, this was actually used for mba building these were the strategies for mba building uh, you know thirdly there were clauses demanding trade privileges including monopoly rights so in a nutshell you know these treaties were simultaneously a defensive alliance and a trading alliance in return for military protection so in in this uh, point also there is a homogeneity and the uh, the final point is that uh, you know fourth politics and fourth strategy can you go to the next slide 10th slide next one next one okay so i would like to uh, quote a sentence by cornelius metelief uh, his vos he was a vos admiral in 1608 he actually said that whenever one concluded a treaty in the in this one should straight away build a fort so apart from seeing this as a mere dialogue of vos official the strategies of vos to the fortress has to be looked at and in fact fortress most of them were adjacent to the sea okay uh, it was imperative it was very important for the export import and surveillance and military so the geopolitical importance of this fortress played a very important role in the expansion of the dutch in the overseas uh, next slide please I, I will show you some examples. So, as per the treaty signed between Dutch and Cochin, signed on uh, March twenty second, sixteen sixty three, it says that no one shall, without the consent of company, grow any palm tree or any other tree on the plain clear near the fort of Cochin, to the north of the palace and the western boundary of Nadutal Parampu, to the west of the Bhagavati Temple, to the north of Tirumangalath and Chakkalakal Parambu, situated in the northeast, and to the west of Iruvelli and Kalvarpis. So the clause actually suggests that the duty of the company was to ensure military surveillance and to control smuggling using fort as a staging area. So these forts were mandatory to control this illegal outflow. So apart from this, there are references of the company rebuilding and reducing the size of the forts in Malabar, especially Cochin, at a higher cost. um so the first question here is how far this force become significant in disc discussions pertaining to the voc treaty making politics so as uh, cornelius metelief su suggested the primary demand of the voc treaties in most of his possessions including cochin was either take over of, either the take over of portuguese forts or building up of new ones or or uh, reducing the size of the uh, portuguese forts and all so acquiring fortress was a clear strategy for commerce and Uh, mba building and this particular need was accomplished through uh, the treaties you know there are quite a lot of evidences to prove the desire for ports from malabar itself and uh, from south india itself and from india itself and uh, i can show you. next slide please sorry sorry next before one okay uh, next one next one the same one sorry okay uh, the second one and the third one the second one is an evidence uh, it actually says that uh, it actually indicates the takeover of the portuguese forts in cochin and uh, the, uh, the the uh, treaty signed on 28th january 1663 which cochin raja also suggests uh, the rebuilding of uh, building of three forts in uh, in palli port and in other two places in malaba Uh, and uh, apart from this there were treaties by which dutch uh, demanded the king of cheribon in java not to build forts without the permission of the company so uh, the fortress the demand of or the desire for forts was a primary demand of the dutch in their company in uh, its possessions in southeast asia and south asia in india as well uh, so there was a clear fort politics or fort strategy uh, through treaties this is what i want to argue in the last point so uh, i would like to conclude my 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 paper uh, so i would like to say that you know the 17th and 18th century witnessed a treaty making revolution in this possession across south east asia and india and and while making treaties frequently the company you know they had proposed a definite framework in calculating local features like i have uh, told in the first point uh, when i came up with uh, the phrase as long as the sun and moon last so the company's beginning and even departure mark the treaty you know and they have deployed diplomacy and sometimes they have disclosed it through the treaties as part of their attempt to build an empire as i have already argued you know the dutch east india company was a company by treaty uh, taking into account all the arguments discussed in the central in the current point in the current paper uh, so you know 
uh, these agreements and they were largely responsible for the company's expansion as they deliberately moved hand in hand with treaties implementing some sort of power over the natives they have contracted with uh, thanks a lot uh, thank you very much again thank you uh, thanks to all the organizers uh, for inviting me thanks a lot thank you very much ms minu for that very wonderful presentation so for our second presentation the speech is entitled the dutch menace and the lino uprising of 1651 the presenter is from Mindanao State University main campus, uh, Mar Malawi, Philippines, Marawi, Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, our presenter, Ms. Kimberly F. Apatan Lusay. Uh, magandang araw sa lahat. Uh, I am Kimberly Apatan Lusay, faculty of history department of MSC Marawi. So, how the fear of Dutch invasion affected interior parts of Mindanao like Linao. The so-called Eight Years' War, some of the battles of this Dutch-Spanish conflict was fought in Moloccan and Philippine waters. The Dutch started instigating the leaders of both Muslim and non-Muslim areas in 1645. All over the Philippines, there was fear of possible Dutch invasion as the Dutch harassed Spanish ships on the seas around the archipelago. The Dutch too started to build networks with native chiefs. They assured freedom from the Spaniards on condition that they, that they would rise up against the Spaniards from their respective territory. This fear led Governor General Diego Fajardo to issue directives that resulted to local disruption and dislocation. As he tightened security measures for harbors, rivers, and military strongholds, he also ordered arrest of suspected Dutch sympathizers and issued a decree for the recruitment of carpenters to be dispatched with their families to work in the shipyards of Cavite and Oton in Iloilo. The chronicler Diego de Santa Teresa said that the decree became a seedbed of many troubles, not only in the coastal area of Caraga, but also in Linao, a village in the interior of Agusan. So where is this Lino located? It is believed to be between the present day town of Bunawan and Talakugon in the province of Agusan del Sur in the island of Mindanao, specifically in Barangay New Era of Bunawan. So indicators close proximity to Agusan River and the presence of lakes in the area, uh, the largest being Lake Mehaba, but this is not yet an uh, official um, identification, but uh, many believe that the Barangay New Era is the uh, location of the old village of Linao. So to give you an idea, this is the municipality of Bunawan in the province of Agusan del Sur. In its eastern side is the Agusan River, the third largest river in the country. Um, leading to northern uh, side, northern part, leading to Utuan. Then uh, its neighboring municipalities, Veruela, Loreto, and Talakugon. Um, Barangay New Era is located somewhere here. So to look closely, there are several bodies of lakes. This, this is lakes, and Lake Mihaba is the largest. So it is believed that the old village of Linao is located here between the lake and Agusan River. Uh, again, uh, you can see the meandering Agusan River. So um, this is part of the Caraga region. Um, here is Surigao del Norte, Surigao del Sur, Agusan del Sur, and Agusan del Norte. Bunawan is located here. And Tandag, because 
uh, there was an important fort in Tandag, contemporaneous with the fort of uh, Linao and Butuan City, of course, the historic Butuan City. So here in Butuan, the Recollect Mission Station, which Linao is one of the dependencies. In 1638, Tandag and Butuan were main mission station and the Vicariatos were Shargao, Bislig, and Linao. So the statistics made by the Recoletos in the year 1650 states that the convent of Layalaya or Ilaya, which means up river, is located 40 leagues distance from Butuan. That is 193 kilometers upriver travel of the winding course of Agusan River. It also mentioned a Spanish garrison, so it must be at Linao. It ministers 1,600 souls. Uh, the term that was used was soul. It did not said Christians. So it is not certain if how many baptized inhabitants were there how many were pacified, and how many are the tribute payer. So I was able to procure an image of the sketch of Linao from the website Portal del Archivo de Españoles or Paris. We have at least a physical evidence of this fort, but it was raised to the ground by the insurgents during the 1651 un unrest and was rebuilt again. It was named Fort San Juan Bautista, annexed to a church and convent under the patronage of Santa Clara de Montefalco. Diego de Santa Teresa wrote in his chronical Historia General de los Religiosos Descalzos that the Fort of Linao in the interior of Agusan was constructed about 1625. It is one of the few inland fortifications in the Philippines. So um, he further said, Fray Jacinto de Folgencio and Agustin de San Pedro put up their residence in Linao. All the Indians there received the faith, and for that reason, they became the target of attacks of their pagan neighbors in the forest. Fray Agustin started training his parishioners in the art of military tactics. He, conven he convinced them that for their protection, it, it would be very useful to construct a stronghold. Since it was impossible to build, to build it of stone, he let them cut many trees and out of trunks of he made a palisade strong enough to resist any attack. This stronghold is still in existence today uh, during the writing of this chronicle and manned by a competent garrison of soldiers for the protection of those Indios. Despite its humble appearance, the fort was one of the defense networks established by El Padre Capitan, or Fray Agustin de San Pedro. It is also an important stopover place for soldiers, religious, and mail carriers from Butuan on the way to Bislig, Tandag, and the rest of Southern Surigao. So Schurz, in his book, Antig Caraga Antigua, he said, here, the Recoleto Padre Capitan um, had established a fort of wooden stakes and earthen wall named Real Fuerte de San Juan Bautista. Its purpose was to prevent the Moros of Davao and Cotabato from penetrating Agusan via Iho, Pulangi, and Agusan River. Simultaneously, it served as a place of refuge for the newly converted local Christians who were not safe anymore from the attacks of some surrounding pagan Manobo and Higaonon tribe. So let's go to the, the Linao Uprising of 1621, uh, 51, rather. The insurrection in Linao took place in the following manner. From Fray Agustin de Santa Maria was the prior of the convent of Santa Maria de Montefalco of Linao. 
he was able to win over the village chieftains, uh, the village chieftain, particularly Dato Dabao, by demonstrating friendship. Dabao reciprocated. He visited the convent frequently and sent his son to be educated by Fray Agustin. But it turned out that this was just part of the ploy in order that the latter's treachery will work out. Diego de Santa Teresa told that Dato Dabao secretly talked with the baptized villagers. He laid before them the harsh de decree of the governor, the offers the Dutch had made, and the attaining of freedom to keep their old religion. Many of the villagers of Linau assented to his plan. The goal was to kill all the Spanish soldiers and ministers. When the insurgents learned that the father provincial, Fray Bernardo de San Laurentio, had not gone out for visitation, but was sending the father ex-provincial instead, they believed that it was a clear sign that the Dutch had infested the coast. So the plot was begun immediately. Dabao sent men to Umayam River in the location of the present day town of Loreto in disguise of receiving the father visitor, but in order to kill him. But uh, Fray Juan de San Antonio proceeded to the convent of Cagayang without stopping to visit Linao. Instead, he sent a Spanish soldiers to carry a letter to the father prior of Linao. To make it short, they failed to, mur to murder the ex-provincial. At the same time, the insurgents began to harass peaceful natives. This turned out as also part of the ploy. Then Dabao offered his service to the Spaniards to capture and, pan and punish the criminal criminals. Then he selected eight men as decoy. Then the Spanish captain ordered that the captured offenders be taken inside the fort where Father Prior Fray Agustin de Santa Maria was already waiting. It was a Trojan horse. Then attack to the fort commenced. The rebels who were already positioned outside the fort came with lances. Dabao cut the captain's neck and Fray Agustin de Santa Maria's body was riddled with lances. Almost all Spaniards and Butuano religious workers lost their lives. Only one religious and five soldiers managed to escape the massacre, and almost all of them were badly wounded. The church and convent were set ablaze. The palace dismantled, and valuables were looted. Quite sure of impending retaliation from the Spaniards, the natives, both innocents and insurgents, then fled to the thick forests. Meanwhile, the survivors headed downriver to Butuan in a bamboo raft that they themselves assembled. They were, they were pursued by the Manubo with swift boats, firing them arrows that multiply their wounds. The Spaniards, seeing that they could not defend themselves, entered the village of Ojot in Ojot River, now the seat of the municipality of Esperanza, also in Agusan del Sur where the people had not yet risen. They sought the help of Datu Palan, and he provided them with 15 men he, to escort them in Agusan River on their way to Butuan. As soon as Fray Miguel de Santo Tomas, prior of the convent of Butuan, learned what happened in Linao, he alerted Tandag and sent a message to the Royal Audiencia of Manila. A general pardon was published to encourage the Manubo to surrender, but many of the surrenderees were hanged, decapitated, and others were sent to Manila and thrown into slavery. Eventually, Fray Agustin de San Pedro interceded for their liberty and, went, and were sent back to Upper Agusan. From the Chronica of Diego de Santa Maria, it described that the city of Manila and districts were flooded with those slaves. Even 
who had been mirrors of loyalty suffered persecution, exile, and imprisonment. Eventually, they were able to regain their honor, but only after their property was lost. The oppressive manners of the Spaniards did put halt to the uprising, but the upshot was a deep hatred of the Banubus against them. So the effect of Linao uprising, um, the wooden palisade was rebuilt minus the church and convent. According to Peter Schroes, after the incident, the religious were forced to abandon Linau. For more than 200 years, no resident priest would be assigned anymore in the interior of Upper Agusan. So we can only imagine here backsliding to ancestral religion. Only the threat of the military outpost of Linau could assure a semblance of safety to Spanish presence in the area. So what became of Linau later? So in the letter of uh, Jesuit missionary Juan Heras to the mission superior on 1884, he described that, that this appearance of the village of Linau uh, was because of a big flood and it forced its inhabitants uh, to transfer to the present day Bunawan. On April 1875, Jesuits settled in Bunawan to begin their missionary works in Upper Agusan, or Layalaya, or Ilaya. And no Dutch attack took place in Tandag and other parts of the eastern coast of Mindanao. But what was the possible underlying grievance of Agusan Manubo that resulted to this uprising? A available primary source did not mention the reason of this uprising, but by looking through Scott's proverbial cracks in the parchment, the grievance could be coming from the first oppressive manner of Spanish soldiers. The people around the fort of Tendag repeatedly complained about this. So it is possible the same attitude was demonstrated by the soldiers assigned in Linau. Second, excessive collection of tribute. In the Memoria de la Religión de los Recoletos, Lina was part of the encomienda of General Agustin, Agustin de Cepeda. The priest also played the role of the, in, of the official tribute collector. To conclude, this paper is a preliminary study and I believe that there are untapped data in the archives outside the country that can tell more about the role of the Dutch to the Linao uprising. I suspect that the Linao uprising did not only cover the village of Linao, but also involved the neighboring villages, especially along Hibon River and Umayam River. My grounds, number one, Umayam Datu must have known the plot when Dabao sent men to Umayam on the pretext of receiving the religious visitor. Number two, the line of the chronicle describing the East Cape's refuge in Uhud, where the people had not yet risen, meaning there might be other villages aside from Linao that Dato Daba was able to convince, and most especially three, how the chronicle recounts the city of Manila and its environs were full of slaves. So there were a large number of accused insurgents shipped to Manila and reduced to slavery. They cannot belong to just one place. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kimberly, for that wonderful presentation. So uh, anyone who wants to ask some questions, please feel free. You can raise, uh, you can you can press the raise hand button, or you can just send your questions.
Okay, I think um, everything is all good. Everything is all clear. So I'll just, um, just a quick um, summary. So what we have learned today is how, how Dutch basically extends its, um, its influence in South, South Asia and then Southeast Asia. And also we have, we have learned um, things, insights about the Lino uprising and then what happened there basically, um, how, how terrible it was and then, then the, the causes of such thing as well. So I think that's that. Um, yeah, we still have time. So you guys, you can still ask questions. Can I uh, make a comment? It's not a question. Can sure, I? Ma uh, sure, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, I was so interested with um, Nino Rebecca's paper uh, because it's the first time I, I uh, encounter this kind of analysis in terms of uh, treaties. Uh, yeah, and um, I was struck by uh, the terminologies being used, like uh, as long as the sun and the moon. So it's like forever. It's like a um, 100 years treaty or something. It's like a forever treaty. Uh, I have that kind of impression. And uh, so it was interesting for me to to see that those treaties uh, had that, those kind of ideas or concepts. And um, I also appreciated how you connected the uh, empire and treaties, you know, because the, the treaties are the ones, um, uh, let's say, um, setting the terrain. They set the terrain. And you said that uh, the, the, the treaties were very homogeneous in the sense that they had uh, this kind of uh, uh, terminologies. Uh, then I was also struck with um, the use of cultural, uh, uh, let's say antecedents or fact uh, concepts, and also the idea of a factory fort. I, because that, I always was struck with why is there always a desire to construct a fort? And it is very clear in your paper that the fort is supposed to be a, uh, a factory. It's a trading center. So that trading center has to be protected by uh, a, fact, uh, a fort. So uh, I see that the Dutch were always conscious that on all their treaties, there should be a provision uh, for the construction of a fort. So I, I, I enjoyed your paper, Rebecca, in other words. Uh, can I make a comment on this? Yes, sure. Oh, thanks a lot, madam. Thanks a lot. I'm honored. I'm honored. Uh, to hear fewer, I'm I'm not that good in Southeast Asian history, so I was just um, I'm not that good in Dutch polygraphy also. So I was uh, translating all these uh, Southeast uh, Dutch uh, corpus diplomatic, and the dispute is concluded by the Chisinda Company in Southeast Asia. So uh, with dearth of a kind of dearth of knowledge in Southeast Asian history, I am humbled and I'm honored enough uh, to get uh, such a good words, kindful words from you, ma'am. And I'm being honored. And I used to make some comments on this. First of all, uh, you know, uh, the about the treaty making, treaty making revolution. I would say uh, of the Dutch and their company. Uh, no much, uh, you know, no other European countries like Portuguese Estado de India or British East India Company. Two of these other countries, they haven't gone through this kind of uh, diplomatical maneuvers. Uh, the uh, the uh, especially in India. Uh, I mean, I'm actually concentrating on India more than Southeast Asia. So what I understood is that the Dutch East India Company was focused more on the treaties, 
uh, rather than worse. Uh, but in Indonesian, when it comes to Indonesia, there were more wars and all. But when it comes to Indian subcontinent, in India, there were no much wars like British East India Company uh, or Portuguese East India, India. But they were, you know, employing diplomacy uh, very uh, cunningly, very uh, sharply. They were employing this particular, you know, diplomacy through uh, for uh, MBA building. Uh, and uh, and another thing is that you know uh, none of the historians, uh, except one, uh, um, none of the historians has actually worked on the treaties of Dutch East India Company because they, you know, it's always a misconception that treaties actually is one-sided, and uh, we are not supposed to study this one-sided treaties and all. Uh, so, no much work has been come out so far about the uh, treaties, especially about the Dutch East India Company treaties. So this is kind of a first attempt. I don't know whether there is any uh, treaties of uh, treaties uh, of uh, um, uh, treaties concluded between. There were any studies uh, studies uh, on treaties concluded by Dutch East India Company with Southeast Asian countries. But I hope, as far as I know, there are no much works on the Dutch uh, treaties uh, concluded between Dutch East India Company and uh, Southeast Asian countries. So this is kind of a first attempt. I I I, I would like to you know, belief and uh, so, but uh, my argument is that we have to study these treaties also. So uh, when we go to, uh, when we go through the lines, when we go, uh, when we, you know, study this critically, we can understand what actually happened. We have to, you know, see both the version of treaties. Uh, if we are studying about uh, the Malayalam treaties, we have to study, there were actually three, uh, Treaties. The Dutch East India Company actually concluded uh, treaties. They have written treaties in Malayalam, then in Portuguese, and even in Dutch. So we have to go through three of these uh, versions, and we have to understand what are the biases, how can we objective and all. So this is kind of a first attempt, uh, um, uh, and uh, this is what I have to say. And coming to the next uh, point, uh, as long as the sun and moon last, and I have to make a, a bit more comment about that. I have to. I mean, I would like to say a little more about that. Uh, you know, uh, it, it was when uh, the last time when uh, the Dutch uh, prince uh, visited India he, uh, during his speech, he actually said that as long as the sun and moon last, he actually reiterated this phrase. And I came across that, you know, I have seen, I thought that, oh, yeah, I have seen this particular phrase in a treatise. When I was just looking at the treatise, I have seen this particular phrase many times. And I thought, yeah, again, this uh, prince is again reiterating this particular phrase. So I just uh, go beyond this particular phrase. And what I understood is that this particular phrase has its roots from third century onwards. So uh, in I have uh, I have gone through some inscriptions. I have gone through the epigraphical evidences. And I came across that this particular phrase uh, is used in uh, Ajanda case. So there is a Buddhist uh, influence uh, in uh, Chola uh, inscriptions, in Chera inscriptions, in Tekate inscriptions. In many of the inscriptions, in the 5th century inscription, 6th century inscription, in the 17th century, in the 13th century, I have seen, I have that paper with me, I can share you if you are interested. So I have gone through the epigraphical evidences, I came to understand that this particular phrase has Sanskrit uh, influence and I uh, actually made a paper on this particular uh, point and I argue that there was Sanskrit cosmopolitanism in the Indian Ocean region, in, in, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, I mean, especially in uh, South India, I haven't seen this particular as long as the sun and moon phrase in uh, North India, but I have seen this particular only in South India, in Coromandel Coast in Malabar. So there was Sanskrit cosmopolitanism in the East Indies, in the in the in the in the, Mal uh, in the Indian Ocean region, in Malabar, in Coromandel, and in the Southeast Asian countries. And the Dutch East India Company, they tactically, they very diplomatically used the, this particular local phrase. There was a cultural in inculturation. Uh, they actually adopted this particular phrase and uh, they have used uh, it in their treaties. Uh, and, and I would argue that they have actually uh, trying to control the psyche of the people by using the local cultures, local uh, phrases. Uh, this is what I want to say. I think I have crossed some time limit. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you too, Ms. Minu. And also for the previous comment, Dr. Kamagai, our PHA president. Thank you. So we have a question here addressed to Ms. Kimberly. So here's the question. Did the Moros try to forge an alliance with non-Christian people in Eastern Mindanao during the early 17th 
century against the Spaniards, or did they tend to focus more on their territories or raiding other Spanish holdings in Visayas? Yes, that's a beautiful question. Um, actually, another feature of the Linao uprising is, is its similarity, its similar pattern on how the Caraga revolt was brewed 20 years ago, that is from 1629 to 1631. It was said that the men of Sultan Kudarat connived with the chieftains of Caraga and that Kudarat will support them against the Spaniards. But for reason that was not clear, maybe because Kudarat became preoccupied with the enemies in his territory in Maguindanao, um, the revolt was carried out, although the said support in any form did not arrive. That's all. all right, there you have it. Thank you very much. So, uh, any other questions? There are no questions. Can I comment? All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this is uh, about Kimberly Apatan's uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for this. I see similarities with another El Padre Capitan. Apparently, there are many priests who became military leaders because remember that you know people haven't an idea that the Spanish period was the, uh, in the Spanish period that the Spaniards were so strong that's why they were able to conquer these uh, uh, territories in the Philippines. But apparently, in some places, they, they only have priests, one priest sometimes. So they have to, you know, to, to train the populace against some of the Muslim neighbors that they have who are harassing them. So, if, for example, in the narrative of Cagayan de Oro, it seems that the Muslims were the uh, villains, you know. So this is why it's it's very Southeast Asian history is very complicated because although um, Dr. Lopez emphasized that uh, we were divided politically, uh, we were not Southeast Asia is not really united at all. So what are you breaking up? Um, the other presentation yesterday, however, said that we were culturally alike. Like we were culturally united. So I guess that shows the complexity of Southeast Asian history as well and Philippine history. Because I, I believe that, you know, um, what do you call this? Um, there was not, not so much, shall we say, uh, unity uh, politically uh, during that time. That the Muslims were really, again, uh, the, some of the Muslims were sometimes in shall we say, in conflict with the, some of the Lumads. So the Lumads, sometimes they tend to, shall we say, um, gravitate towards the Spaniards in, in many places. And I think uh, that's also true in some places like Tabum. So yeah, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is like a very good um, presentation in such a way that it, it shows us the complexities of the politics, not much of the religion, because, you know, we just sometimes in our conflicts, we just use religion as our, our you know, uh, excuse. But more or less, it's really uh, politics, power, land, and, and all of that. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for that one, sir. So for the speakers, thank you very much for the time and effort you guys have given us. And for the audiences, thank you as well. So that's a wrap. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for giving me such an Thank opportunity. Thanks goes to everyone, every, every organizers and uh, co, uh, co presenter also. Thanks a lot. And we will now proceed to the next panel. For those who are just joining us, we just finished the panel on the Dutch in Southeast Asia. And now we are proceeding to the panel on Magellan on the Magellan Elcano expedition. There will be two speakers in this panel, Michael Angelo Doblado of the Palawan State University and myself, Fernando A. Santiago Jr. of De La Salle University, Manila. So we shall begin with the lecture of Professor Doblado. But uh, before that, I'd like to remind our the members of the audience that at any point in time, you may type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, or if you'd prefer to speak, 
please uh, press the raise hand button. So without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Michael Angelo Doblado. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I'm trying to uh, start the video. So my uh, talk this um, morning uh, would focus on uh, the Palawan, uh, Palawan landfall of the Magellan Elcano voyage in uh, the Philippines. Uh, Dr. F uh, Santiago, uh, are you seeing this? Yes, I can see your slide. Okay, so triangulation in historical site identification. So the significance of the study, it's part of the 2019 position paper submitted to the uh, National Historical Commission of the Philippines. So it identified uh, the landfall areas in Palawan for the, uh, in time for the quincentennial celebration. So it's also part of the Palawan Study Center mandate as part of the local historical committees network under the NHCP. And most important of all, uh, it tries to fill the gap in Palawan's local history because the voyage, the Magellan Elcano voyage is not part of the local historical uh, consciousness. So these are the challenge faced by the study. There were few studies on identifying the actual Palawan landing sites. And uh, usually, if Palawan is mentioned uh, in a study about the circumnavigation of the world or the route taken by Magellan, it's mentioned in, in passing or as a footnote or in a uh, generalized manner. So there was no specific study on uh, the site identification in Palawan. And uh, the possible landfall sites uh, presented, usually presented, were uh, as a calculated guess or citing other sources. So there's what we call the completing the circle resulting in a dead end. So you have the book of uh, Dr. Neil Ocampo citing uh, Robertson that probably uh, the first encounter uh, was in a borland and or in a gawan in Puerto Princesa and the first uh, local engage engagement were with the uh, Tagbanua. And then you have James Eder, uh, a prominent Palawan uh, anthropologist from the United States, cited Robert, uh, Robert Fox, uh, that Robert Fox hinted that it could have been possible with the uh, Tagbanua. And yeah, it so happened that Robert Fox was also citing Robertson. So he, uh, the useful sources comes to a, a dead end. And there are folk stories on expedition, on the expedition anchoring in Puerto Princesa, uh, as far as Taytay and uh, Northeast in, in Cuyo. Uh, but these uh, uh, studies about uh, landings in Puerto Princesa, Taytay and Cuyo uh, have no actual research yet. I haven't seen uh, actual uh, research or came, uh, came across actual research done on this. So what we did here is the triangulation for historic uh, site identification. That's uh, what I call the, the combination of the methods. First, uh, the primary sources were Antonio Pigafetta's Chronicles, the unnamed Genoese pilot's uh, notes, and Francisco Alvo's logbook. So these were the main uh, primary sources. And also the study of the maps, uh, contemporaneous or extant during the time of the Magellan Elcano voyage from Gastaldi, Mercator, Ortilius, and the Murillo Velarde map. So the purpose is to plot uh, the navigational bearings given by the primary sources on the maps. And then we studied also the ethnographic studies uh, conducted by uh, Manuel Venturillo in 1907 in Palawan and by Robert Fox in 1954. This is to, to ascertain uh, the best or who would have been the, 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 the inhabitants that the crew uh, had come into contact with. And then there's this German uh, historian, Oscar Kolliker. He published his own um, circumnavigation uh, trace route in 1912. It touched Palawan, but it uh, did not mention any partic particular area or place name. 
And from the primary sources we gathered, we identified the different ship's bearings and we compare them and cross-validate them with uh, modern GPS application in order to estimate the margin of difference because it's uh, commonly accepted internationally that uh, the navigational bearings or the coordinates given by the, the primary sources are not really that accurate at that point in time. And then we study the toponyms, variations and changes in place names in Southern Palawan. And then we have actual site uh, inspections. So the research approach to identify the landing sites in Palawan. So again, uh, we tried to look for the coordinates. We studied and analyzed the local encounters mentioned and look for clues uh, with regards to the place names given. So the navigation of bearings from the sources, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's not really that reliable, but it gives you a sense of direction. And the cross-reference bearing used modern GPS application. It shows you the exact location uh, of particular places, municipalities or towns in, in Palawan. And then you plot the approximate areas on the contemporary map of Palawan. And then support this with secondary sources uh, with the ethnographic studies done and construct a plausible narrative to make historical sense, especially the logical sequencing of the landings done in, in the province. So here are the excerpts from the sources. The first is from Antonio Pigafetta. So he mentioned that the island lies nine and one third degrees towards the Arctic Pole and it is called Palawan. Uh, we all, uh, it's accept, uh, accepted internationally that Antonio Pigafetta is the uh, the recognized no, authority with, with regards or the, the primary source. But if you would only uh, get Antonio Pigafetta's uh, uh, source as the only uh, reference, you would only have one navigational bearing. The Genoese pilot also said that they reached the islands at nine degrees and a half. And Francisco Alba said that it's nine and one third. Uh, that's the northern extent of their exploration and the southern extent is eight degrees and one third. Now if you triangulate this, you see here this, these are the, the bearings, no? the Genius pilot gave 9.30, the Albo in Pigafetta 9 and 20, only Albo has given the uh, southern limit of their voyage. And uh, to give the viewers uh, uh, a sense of place, so this is you have here the map of the Philippines and the inset there. Uh, and then you have Puerto Princesa, Palawan, that's the middle portion. Uh, the study would focus on Aborlan. So Aborlan to Nara, that's the old Aborlan area because Nara was just created uh, around 1960. And you have Sopronio, Española, uh, Brooks Point and Batarasa, and then also Quezon. So that's actually the area of the research. So here, if you plot it in a modern uh, or contemporary Palawan map, you can see the northern extent of their voyage. Uh, it did not reach Puerto Princesa. And the other given by Albo and, uh, and Pigafetta, that's 9 and 20, it's actually already in the municipality of Nara. And the, the southernmost limit is 8 degrees and 20 uh, minutes, and that's Buliluyan in the town of Bataraza. So compare that with the Murillo Velarde map. So you can see that there's no Nara yet. No? Uh, 1700s na, na map. You can see that it's Aborlan or the old Aborlan area. Dun sa uh, with their northern, uh, uh, northern limit of their voyage. So terminating their northern exploration, they would have anchored somewhere along the Aborlan Nara area. So uh, old Aborlan is the ancestral domain of the Tagbanwa's earlier settlements. And Ab Aborlan was already indicated in the 1758 Murillo Velarde map together with Punta de Asuncion or Puerto Princesa today. So Puerto Princesa's bearing is between nine, uh, nine degrees and seven minutes and nine degrees and eight minutes. It registers a full two to three degrees difference compared to the generous pilot Albo Figafeta values. So it did not reach the, the proximity of the boundary of Puerto Princesa. So here's the excerpt of the first anchorage in Palawan. 
So they reached us nine degrees and a half where they went ashore one day with the boats equipped to seek for provisions. So they attempted to land. So they anchored and some of the soldiers transferred to a smaller boat and they attempted to land, but they were driven away. So on reaching shore, the, ins the inhabitants would not suffer them to land and shot at them with arrows. So this makes the old uh, Berlin area the first site of the anchorage, or the first anchorage. So the first encounter with the local inhabitants were probably with the Tagban was of Aborlan. So this was an abrupt, uh, abrupt affair because they were attacked by the natives with narrows of cane hardened in the fire, forcibly driven away from the shore. So again, this is the excerpt. So, so the inhabitants would not suffer them to land and shot at them with arrows of cane hardened in the fire. So again, returning back to the map, so this is the approximate area of the first anchorage. Now we go to the first and second Palawan landfall. So if the first attempt to land in a Borland field, the crew tried again. They tried first, at first, to proceed north, northward, but they doubled back and sailed southward because uh, the month then was June. It was early June, and it was already the onset of the Venda Valles or the Habagat. So they were sailing against the current. And then they went southward and looked for a safe anchorage area. Nearest was Bahia de Islas, or the Bay Islands, or Island Bay. Or it can actually be this San Antonio Bay fronting Brooks Point, because Bahia de, de Islas is uh, fronting Sofronio Española town. At this time, only one soldier came ashore. So it's John Campos, and he was welcomed at this time. So this was this description uh, by the Genoese pilot. So Joam Campos went ashore. Uh, he actually uh, was invited to go inside, you know, inside the interior, the distance of one league. And when he was in the village, the people came to see him. They gave him food and entertained him well. So this country is called uh, Jigwasam, and it is in nine degrees. So Tagusau has most important clues. So adopting nine degrees as the generous pilot cross-referenced value with present locations in Hispaniola. So these are the three barangays of Hispaniola. You have Pulut Interior, Pulut Centro, and Pulut Shore. So these are the bearings on, on the right column. So you have here the Genoese pilot value of nine degrees, and then the following values for the different barangays inside Sofronio in Hispaniola. So again, Campos mentioned the uh, Jagusam, which refers to the Tagusaw area. This also supports or uh, corroborates Albus' narrative reporting his version of Tagusaw, having heard it as Saukaw, as stated. So they went nine degrees and one fourth east, coasting along it until the town of Saukaw. So um, the letter C or Z in, in Spanish is uh, pronounced as Z. So this would have been probably uh, pronounced as Sao Zao. So Sao Sao, since the letter C is pronounced as Z. So Tagusao Genius Pilots accounts mentioned uh, Jigosam or the variation of Tagusao uh, differently. So you have different variation. You have Jagusam, Jagwasam, Jagwasani, and Digwasam. In Albo, it was Sao Zao. So the first landing site probably was the Tagusao area of Ipolote, Sofronia Española today, wherein they traded in Ipolote and were invited to sail to another site and anchored in a port. So the second landing uh, probably was the port of Tegusao or Tagusao today, which is shown in the Pigafetta drawn map of Palawan. So here, back to the Murillo Velarde map, you can see that Ipolote is Pulot, which became Sofronia Española in 1990. And then it's also marked here, Tagusao, uh, at the southern part. So we go back to the excerpt from the Genoese pilot. So they set sail and went to anchor at the village of those who had come to call them. So bear in mind, they already landed the first time. They were welcomed, especially the, the soldier. They were fed and entertained, and they traded with uh, with with the first uh, group they encountered. And uh, I think if you use historical imagination, word spread along the coast that there are foreigners 
who were trading. So a delegation coming from another village invited them to trade with them also. So the Spaniards obliged, so they set sail and went to anchor at the village of those who had come to call them. So they set sail for this port, and this was also uh, mentioned or labeled, marked by the Genoese pilot as Diguasam on the 21st day of July 3 to seek for Borneo. So Diguas, Diguacam as Diguasam. So here's a, a very wonderful uh, map. Uh, I, I think this was mentioned, no? Uh, the manuscript map in Pigafetta's uh, Chronicles. This is from the French version. So you can see here on your uh, left side at the bottom, it's marked Porte de Tagusao or Port of Tagusao. And then you have in the middle, uh, Pigafetta marked this as the island of Palawan. And on the north, it's Sundan or Borneo. So if you would be reading this, uh, it would might, it, it wouldn't, cause or might cause confusion. So we have to read this on its reversed, uh, reverse side for the proper orientation of the map. So when you reverse the map, you will see that Porte de Tagusao is actually in the eastern coastline. And then Palawan for the entire province or the entire island. And then you have Sundan, which is Borneo. So they are now in their properly righted navigational bearings. So that's the way to read it. So. There was a geographical dilemma because there is still a third Tagusao, which is a barangay Tagusao in Quezon, Palawan. Uh, uh, that's where the, the, the Taban ma man was uh, under, uh, dug. No? So it was a coastal barangay facing the West Philippine Sea. So it's almost parallel with Tagusao in Hispaniola, but it's on the opposite side. So the question there is, was there also an anchorage or landing done there? No? So do we recalibrate the entire landing sequence. So fortunately, uh, we came across a, a map. This was in 1705, it's uh, published in Paris. So you can see here on your left, it says, C de Tagusao, meaning Capo de Tagusao. And interestingly, it's divided into three areas. You have the Auroi de Borneo, meaning to the king of Borneo. And then you have on the northern part, Fort O Espanol. Uh, I tried to Google the meaning of Fort O Espanol. I was expecting Fort, Spanish Fort, but it says to the strength, to the strong Espanol, meaning this is actually the area which uh, the Spaniards controlled. So they don't have control of the middle part. Also, uh, the Muslims who were under uh, the Sultan of Borneo also have no control of the middle part. So the middle part is actually occupied by the Tagbanua. The southern part is by the Palawan. So basically the second and uh, third landing, uh, most probably the crew were actually in contact with the Palawan. And you can also surmise that the entire uh, southern portion under the, the Sultan of Borneo is actually Tagusao region or one area. So here you have another. So from 1705, you have one printed in Amsterdam still retaining Cap Capo de Tagusao in the portion which is under the influence of Borneo and the northern part under the Spaniard. This is consistent also with the 1744 uh, map. You can clearly see here Tagusao was mentioned, Capo de Tagusao, and here there's already a Spanish fort. So we confirm this through another source. So this is actually from Alexander uh, Dalrymple. He wrote a book uh, entitled A Full Clear Proof That the Spaniards Have No Claim to Balambangan. So here's the quotation. No? Southwest, by, uh, you have here Para Paragua is the third in magnitude among the Filipinas. And its farthest point toward the southwest is uh, Tagusao. So Tagusao is acknowledged and paid tribute to the king of Borneo. And it's also interesting that uh, Dalrymple was actually quoting directly from the La uh, Labor Evangelica uh, written by Padre Francisco Colin in 1663. And uh, I, I'd like to add this because if, if you search uh, internationally, you Google this, 
by Palay Kukarakan Bam is also mentioned as a place name. No? So the word Palay, Ragal for rice, and the next sentence is in the text seems to indicate an offer to trade was mistaken for the name of this island. This is actually the footnote of Robertson in his uh, in his in his translation of of uh, Pigafetta. And here are the variants, no? But you can see Vipalai Kukarakambam is uh, uh, prevailing. So we try to cross it with the existing Palawan, Palawan or Palawan translation. So you can see here, Vai Palai, Kukara is Su Zara, and then Kambam is Sambam. So these are possibly the, the nearest uh, derivative no, from, from the Palawan, uh, Pal uh, Palawan word. So Ba meaning uh, the sentence that would follow is actually in, in a question form. Palay, which is uh, a noun, refers to rice still in the husk or yung tawag na palay or bigas. Sara means to agree. You are glad, satisfied. Sambi and the variant sambian, sembian, sembit are actually meaning trade, exchange, substitute, change one thing for another. So it's plausible that it's not a place name. It's actually an offer to trade. If you would be using the Palawano or Palawano translation. So this is from the dictionary compiled by Charles MacDonald, who spent 30, 30 years studying and compiling uh, the, 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 the language of the, the Palawan. So the third and fourth landing. So Pigafetta narrated the events after their journey for, from Borneo and returning to the Philippines via the southernmost end of Palawan. So they, were, they struck a shoal near an island named Bibalon, meaning Bibalon meant Balabak in other uh, maps, it was Belaba or Balaba. So this becomes the third landing site. So they have to cock, cock the ships because it ran aground. So here's the general area of Balabak. So Balabak is famous uh, through history as a place where ships are, are grounded. So this is the general approximate area in the middle where uh, Magellan's uh, surviving ship might have been grounded. And then they went to Buliluyan Batarasa, Palawan's southernmost tip after fixing their boats in one of the island or shoals in Balabak. Excuse me, so, professor, time uh, to wrap up. Uh, okay, okay, sorry. So it's connection. So we use the manuscript map, like what Dr. Ambet Ocampo has said. Uh, Dr. Love said to gain prestige, the ruler must trade. So in, in one of the sorties of the Magellan Elcano expedition, they actually hostage a, a governor <clears throat> And he has to ransom himself. Now, the governor is actually trading. And Dr. Victor Torres had mentioned about library on your desk. More than half of the research done is actually using the library on your desk. And Madame Feliz Prudente Santa Maria said food. So as a purveyor of friendship, negotiation, trade, currency, even ransom, it's, it's actually a facilitator of connections. Okay, so uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Doblado. So we will have the open forum after the second presentation to be made to be made by myself. And the title of my paper is Assessing the Views on Enrique de Malacca the first Southeast Asian to circumnavigate the world. When discussing the events of 1521 in the Philippines, the question that is often asked is how did Magellan communicate with the natives? The answer is that Magellan had a Malay interpreter whose name is Enrique de Malacca or Enrique of Malacca. Enrique has fascinated Filipinos, Malaysians and to a lesser extent it seems um, the Indonesians. His reputation now ranges from a mere slave to a national hero, even from a myth to a legend. The objective of my short presentation is to assess the dominant views on Enrique de Malacca in the Philippines and Malaysia, and to compare them with Enrique in the primary sources. It is an effort to separate fact from fiction and its goal is to view Enrique from the lens of history. In the Philippines, the popular knowledge of Enrique is based on 
the writings of Carlos Quirino, a Filipino national artist for historical literature. Quirino was the proponent of the idea that Enrique was a Filipino, as he wrote in an article. Um, in the article, The First Man Around the World was a Filipino, published in the Philippines Free Press on December 28, 1991. In his book, Who's Who in the Philippines, or Who's Who in Philippine History, rather, published in 1995, the same author wrote that Enrique was arguably the first man to circumnavigate the globe and added that he was born in Karkar, Cebu, circa 1493, and died at Cebu, circa 1563. He then went on to say that his early life is unknown, but he was said to be fishing off the coast of Cebu when he was captured by pirates and brought to the slave trade center of Malacca, the Portuguese colony of what is now Malaysia. Magellan purchased him because he came from an unheard of place, named him Enrique, then took him along to India, Africa, and Lisbon, Portugal. Before they left Spain on their voyage to the east, Magellan freed him as a slave, although Enrique did not know this. Then they traveled to Guam, then to Cebu, where Enrique witnessed the killing of his master by the Mactan chieftain Lapu-Lapu and decided he would not return to Spain as a slave. The new commander, Barbosa, ordered him to ask Raja Humabon for jewels to be presented to the king. Instead, he set the Spaniards up for a lunch with the local leader at which they were slain. He proved useful to Humabon for his knowledge of Spanish and Portuguese. He must have married, raised a family, and passed away in his 70s just before Legaspi arrived. Unfortunately, Quirino never mentions his sources. And he portrays Enrique as a local boy who eventually returns home and in doing so just becomes the first man to circumnavigate the world. So there's no agency involved. Okay? He, it was simply the circumstances that made him okay, accomplish that tremendous feat. Now, the narrative is designed to assert two points. First, that Enrique was a Filipino. And second, that he was the first to circumnavigate the world. So again, unfortunately, these claims are unsubstantiated and thus many details in his narrative are purely imaginary. While the earlier article may be acceptable as a work of literature, his having included the above stated biography in his book, Who's Who in Philippine History, gave it a semblance of historical legitimacy. And before long, the story of Enrique, the Filipino who was the first to circumnavigate the world, made its way into some classrooms. The fictional Enrique was thus portrayed as a historical Enrique, and hence the creation of, well, it's more of a myth than a legend, unfortunately. Okay. Now, in Malaysia, the popular knowledge of Enrique is based on the novel Panglima Awang. Harun Aminur Rashid's post-colonial novel written in 1957 Professor Ahmad Murad Merikan provides a summary of Pangmilema Awang in his book, Revisiting Atas Angin, a review of the Malay imagination of Rum, Feringhi, and the Penjaja. Okay, because, uh, well, as far as I know, Panglima Awang has not been formally translated to English. Now, basically, the story goes, and based on the summary by Professor Murad, Malacca uh, had been conquered by Albuquerque and was treacherously aided by foreign merchants within the city. So the Sultan fled, and Enrique, who was known as Panglima Awang or Commander Awang, leads a small guerrilla band, fights on, but is captured in a raid on a Portuguese ship and then taken to Goa to be sold as a slave in Portugal. Magellan, the ship's captain, comes to respect Awang and buys him from Albuquerque and then names him Enrique and makes him his personal assistant. In Portugal, he is warmly received as a member of Magellan's family. Magellan's sister even falls in love with him, but he remains faithful okay, to Tungaya, his fiancée, whom he left behind in Malacca. So the basic story goes on where um, uh, Magellan, 
moves from the Portuguese court to the Spanish court and eventually receives his uh, blessings to cross the Atlantic onwards to the Pacific. And uh, basic, the basic story of how he played a significant role in uh, uh, forging an, a friendship with the king of Cebu in particular is mentioned. Okay, and then yes, uh, after that, the the death of Magellan, and then the uh, the the, uh, the 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 meal where there was a massacre. Okay, and uh, basically, Awang informs the king of the uh, evil intentions of the Spaniards after Magellan was killed, and uh, a surprise attack on the Spanish fleet uh, kills the man who replaced Magellan, who was Barbosa. So Awang returns to. Okay, so he says that uh, Enrique returns to Melaka on a Siamese ship. And along the way, Awang's men seize the ship. Having reunited with his comrades, he then sails with them to Johor and continues overland to Moir to learn more about the resistance against the Portuguese. He finds out that his fiance has become a leader of a guerrilla band. And happily reunited, they marry and set out for Pahang to find the Sultan and continue the struggle to restore Malacca to him. So the novel transforms Enrique from a Malay slave turned interpreter into a rebel fighter and a hero of his people. According to Professor Murad, the novel may be read as representing the West or the Malay image of the Feringi or the Portuguese and other Western foreigners. He then provides an excellent discussion of the symbolism, meaning and other uh, relevance of the novel. But what's interesting is that much of the details mentioned in Ang Lima Awang, again, is not based on primary sources. I'm sorry, uh, this is uh, Harun Am Am Mino Rashid, okay, the author of Pang Lima Awang. So who was Enrique? What do the historical sources say about him? There are three documents that provide background information on Enrique de Malaca. The best known is Antonio Pigafetta's Primo Viaggio in Torno al Mondo, where Enrique is simply identified as of Sumatran origin. Antonio Pigafetta was a young Italian who joined the Magellan Elcano expedition as a volunteer. He took on the task of rec recording the events of the trip, thus producing the longest and most valuable narrative of the voyage. He was among the few who were fortunate to return to Spain in the year 1522, thus being one of the first to circumnavigate the world. The value of his narrative to historians is that it is an eyewitness account, the ideal primary source. And he was also personally acquainted with Enrique, so he knew him personally. The second source is De Molucci's Insulis by Maximilianus Transilvanus, who said that Enrique was born in the Moluccas and whom Magellan bought in Malacca. Unlike Pigafetta, he was not part of the voyage. I'm referring to Transilvanus. Nonetheless, he published the earliest account on the Magellan Elcano expedition using information gathered from interviews with the survivors of the expedition including Sebastian Alcano, the commander of the ship that made it back. So his methodology would be equivalent to oral history today. The third source is the last will and testament of Ferdinand Magellan. Magellan was the master of Enrique who led the Armada de Maluco on its voyage to circumnavigate the world until he met his fate in the Philippines in 1521. The will was executed by the great explorer at Sevilla, Spain on August 24, 1519, about a month prior to his voyage for the New World. And the portion of the will that uh, concerns Enrique states the following. By the way, uh, that document was, uh, I think it is being restored in Spain and that is a photograph, okay, that, that uh, which you see on the screen. So the document states, and by this my present will and statement, I declare and ordain as free and quit of every obligation of captivity, subjection and slavery, my captured slave Enrique Mulato, 
native of the city of Malacca of the age of 26 years, more or less, that from the day of my death, thenceforward, forever, the said Enrique may be free and manumitted and quit, exempt, and relieved of every obligation of slavery and subjugation, that he may act as he desires and thinks fit. And I desire that of my estate, there may be given to the said Enrique the sum of 10,000 maravedis in money for his support. And this manumission I grant because he is a Christian and that he may pray to God for my soul. Of the three documents, the will is the shortest, but it provides the greatest amount of detail on the background of Enrique. The will also reveals the following key information regarding his identity, his status, race, origin, age, and his religion. Contrary to the Transylvanus account, it states that Enrique was captured and not purchased by Magellan. Capturing the enemy and making him a slave used to be a normal part of warfare anywhere in the world. And one may speculate that Magellan captured Enrique during the Portuguese conquest of Malacca. Also, if Enrique was estimated to be 26 years old in 1519, he would have been around 18 years old um, during the conquest in 1511 old enough to be a soldier. The document also describes Enrique as a mulatto. Mulatto is a racial category used in the Spanish empire to refer to people of mixed race with African ancestry. This appears to be the basis of Enrique's other moniker, Enrique the Black or Black Henry. It is quite intriguing that Enrique was described as a mulatto for it suggests that he had black skin or even that he was of African ancestry. However, it must be taken into consideration that racial categories have been constantly redefined and can thus mean different things at different times. It may be worth noting that in the narration of uh, Esteban Rodriguez on the voyage and conquest um, uh, of the Philippines by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, he described Filipino women they encountered as having good brownish mulatto features. The word mulatto as used by Magellan should thus not be understood in the strict sense, okay, today. In the context of his time, by calling him mulatto, Magellan simply described Enrique as a man with dark skin which is typical of the Malay race or the biological, okay, in the biological sense. Now, as mentioned earlier, both Antonio Pigafetta and Maxima Maximilianus Transilvanus pointed to Indonesia as Enrique's place of origin, his place of birth. However, Magellan in his last will and testament described his slave as a native of the city of Malacca. This means that by contemporary standards, Enrique would be Malaysian. This was the statement made on a legal, legal document from a man who presumably knew Enrique best. The idea of Enrique's Indonesian origin may thus have been an error committed by Pigafetta and Trans Transilvanus. While Pigafetta wrote the essential record of events and, uh, that transpired during the first circumnavigation and was also personally acquainted with Enrique, knowledge of his background could not have been as extensive as Magellan's, who knew him for a much longer period. It is unfortunate that he didn't mention why he said that Enrique was Sumatran and where he derived the information. Transilvanus, on the other hand, never met Enrique. What he knew about him was a secondhand information derived from those he interviewed. He may thus have concluded that Enrique originated from the Moluccas because of his ability to speak the language of the islands. Indeed, it was the moment when Enrique communicated with the natives that Magellan and his crew realized. That's when they confirmed that they had succeeded in their mission of reaching the Far East by sailing westward. It thus appears that Transilvanus, or his source, simply assumed Enrique's place of origin because of the language that he spoke. Among the three historical documents, Magellan's last will and testament should be regarded as the most reliable of Enrique's origin for several reasons. First, it is a legal document, 
made under oath, which increases the likelihood of its truthfulness and accuracy. Second, it came from a person who was most familiar with him being his longtime master. Third, it was drafted before the journey to the Spice Islands, making it untainted with the events of the voyage. Thus, based on the last will and testament, it can be stated that the historical records favors the argument that Enrique was truly from present day Malaysia. The final detail is that Enrique was a Christian. Now there's no record on what religion he practiced prior to converting or even if he converted at all. His conversion shall therefore remain speculative. Nonetheless, the probability that he was a convert is high because the Iberians were known to have carried the zeal of converting others to their religion um, as, as stated in many studies. Okay, the missionary zeal was part of the Spanish mission and the conversion was part of the, um, of the objectives. And uh, well, just like Spain, Portugal was also part of the Reconquista and looking at the accounts, Magellan was affected by the same zeal. So this could have motivated him to convert Enrique to Christianity if it, it had been necessary. So the complete story of Enrique de Malacca will never be known, but the people of the Malay archipelago will remember him as the Malay man who participated in one of the greatest voyages of all time, the expedition that proved that the world is round. There's no historical evidence that Enrique completed the circumnavigation, but his significant role in the mission cannot be denied. The most important is that moment when Enrique successfully communicated with Filipinos, which proved that they, had that they had reached Southeast Asia by sailing the opposite direction. Okay, so it was certainly a moment in world history okay, that is uh, very important. And the Southeast Asian, particularly from the Dunya Melayu, uh, um, made it possible. So while we may call Enrique as the Malay world's original uh, international man of mystery, okay? I think that uh, the Dunya Melayu or Nusantara can claim him okay, to some extent as a common symbol of uh, the people. Uh, if Magellan owned him as his slave, then the people of Southeast Asia can also own Enrique. So the uh, stories of Quirino and um, uh, uh, the, the, in the novel of um, Panglima Awang uh, basically uh, expresses okay, the post-colonial uh, reaction of the people in the region to take control of their narrative. It is a recognition of a Southeast Asian's place in history, in world history. Okay? Evidence that we were around and it, that we had a role to play. So with that, um, I think it would be appropriate to also call Enrique, not just Enrique de Malacca, as Enri but as Enrique de Dunia Melayu. And thank you very much. So now we proceed to the open forum. So we have a raised hand from Nonya Tonko, and we will begin with uh, her question. So you may now unmute your microphone. Uh, the sources mentioned are the last will and testament, Maximilus Transylvanus Pigofeta. Any possibility that there could still be unearthed sources or any secondary because in my graduate studies I recall reading uh, I don't know if it was a doctoral study or something uh, but this was uh, pre pre martial law there was no mention of uh, there was no mention of Enrique so that means that the, these materials were not yet accessible yes well there are other sources but the ones that I used are the ones that are closest to the event. There's an extensive biography written by Don Martin Fernandez de Navarrete, written in 1837, 
which I find oh. to be the uh, most reliable uh, secondary source, but then it is a secondary source. Mm -hmm. So I prioritized the primary sources that I considered most reliable. So these primary sources, are, are around what time did they, did they become accessible? Well, um, as, as far as Pigafetta uh, was concerned, almost immediately after his return to Spain, but it was not yet translated. Oh, no, no. And the, the original book was written in French. Oh. Okay. I'm not sure about when it was translated to English. Okay, because, um, yes. Okay, so we'll proceed now to the next question. And the question is for Professor Doblado. So Pigafetta recorded that a Palawan chief ransomed his son from the Spaniards with goats, rice, etc., and even doubled the amount because the place has plenty. Where was this in Palawan? The question comes from Gloria Melencio. Uh, thank you for, for that question. Um, as mentioned in, in uh, Pigafetta's account, they actually left the Cape or the end point of this island, and he referred to it as the island of Palawan. So they were sailing. Uh, uh, southward when they came into contact with uh, vessels carrying food and they ransom it uh, only to find out that uh, one of one of the, the the one of those who were on the boat was actually uh, a governor of Palawan and they held him in ransom for for several uh, uh, food provisions and this governor actually doubled the ransom. So the reading there was uh, um, he had to keep his uh, prestige. Uh, he, uh, he doesn't want that uh, those were the only ones to be demanded from him as, uh, as an exchange for his ransom. So most probably this is from the tip of Palawan, which is uh, Buliluyan, uh, because Buliluyan is a contraction or is a name or a barangay in Bataraza, the southernmost town. And the southernmost uh, barangay is Buliluyan. It's Buli meaning bottom and Lihan resting place. So tradition has it that uh, boats flying this route coming from either Cagayan de Tawi, Tawi, Mapun, going to Balabok or going down Borneo and vice versa would rest here in between their trips. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a comment from Professor Ahmad Murad Merikan, okay, the author I cited earlier. He's with us today. Popular knowledge of Enrique in Malaysia called him Panglima Awang or Panglima Hitam. Panglima means warrior in Malay, and Hitam means black. Harun Aminur Rashid's novel, Panglima Awang, renders itself as a historical novel written in the mid-1950s. Now, from a comment from uh, Michael uh, Shaochua, when Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad said that Enrique was Panglima Awang, a Filipino historian thought this as accurate and funny thing. The conjecture was that Panglima Awang is a Filipino term. Therefore, Enrique was a Filipino. Thanks for clarifying the life of Enrique. Well, I, I just want to comment about that, uh, uh, Mr. Chua. Uh, Prime Minister Mahathir actually stated that Enrique was a Filipino when he delivered a speech in late 1991 in South America. So it was a United Nations event. And in his speech, he, he basically stated that uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia basically stated that contacts between the Malays and South America began okay, during the Magellan expedition when Enrique de Malacca, a captured slave from the Philippines, joined the Magellan expedition. So that story okay, of uh, Enrique being a Filipino was derived uh, well, uh, partly from that speech of Prime Minister Mahathir. Now, I haven't found the exact date of uh, that speech, but Carlos Quirino published the article I mentioned earlier on December 28, 1991. So it was in the same year. I'm just not sure if it was before or after the uh, speech of Prime Minister Mahathir. Now, um, we have so many questions. Um, uh, 
Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry I have to select through the questions pouring in, but we have a question from Feliz Noel Rodriguez. Did you look at the original will and testament or only the English translation? Um, well, what I used was the English translation because the original ah. will. Anyan. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, because the original will is not accessible. So the um, translation, I'm sorry. Uh, the translation I used comes from Francis Henry H. Guillemard, Magellan's Wills, The Life of Ferdinand Magellan and the First Circumnavigation of the Globe, 1480 to 1521, published in 1890. Okay, so well, mainly because I didn't have access to the will. But the other documents, I read the original Spanish versions. I'm sorry, uh, the, the original versions. Okay. So another comment from um, Professor Murad. Panglima, panglima is a Malay term, variations of which are used throughout the Malay archipelago. From Professor Ambeth Ocampo, I think Navarrete has been translated and annotated by J.S. Cummins for the Hakiluyot Society, and Cummins also translated Morga. Um, a question, will, be, will sources of external ex internal criticisms and readings in Philippine history? Um, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Jose Victor, Professor Jose Victor Torres wants to ask a question. So, so I'll turn on his microphone. Afterwards, uh, Mr. Filimon Hunteriel. Professor Torres. Hi, uh, Dr. Santiago. Can, can I be heard? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just two and one. One comment for uh, uh, Professor Doblado and uh, probably one, one uh, question for you. Um, in the case of um, Professor Doblado, could the translation of the fork or Espanol could probably could refer to the Spanish fort that is located on, in Paragua? That that fort I think is being uh, was a, a project that was supposed to be restored uh, before in the 1990s, but I think it wasn't continued. Uh, it appears in the, uh, the 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 illustration of the fort appears in um, in the document of Valdesi Tamon. Well, the uh, and it was yeah located in the northern part of the island. I don't I think you're familiar with it, no? Because um, um, you um, you were I think. Um, uh, referred to, from what I remember, you know, because I was part of the um, the the um, team of the Intramuros administration that was uh, going to to look at the you know, to look at uh, the fort, but it wasn't uh, continued. No? So, could it probably refer to a structure itself and not just a um, and not just a um, a uh, illustration of power? Uh, I think, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Dr. Torres. Uh, I, I do agree that it's it's actually referring to to the fort. I was just uh, trying to expound it that uh, the fort also symbolizes that's the the edge or or the frontier in, in terms of of power or jurisdiction of mm. the Spaniards in Paragua or the main island. And there's actually a line uh, in the 1709 or 1705 map. Uh, that, that indicates that it's the, the extent of their, their, their power. And in the middle, in the central, is uh, the words are actually described by uh, Father Francisco Colin as they are barbaric and they are uncivilized and they are actually uh, always revolting or fighting either the Moro and the, the Spaniards. And, and down south, you have another line uh, which indicates that this is now Tagusau. Uh, Tagusao region, because there's three Tagusao there, one in Quezon, one in Española, and one in, in, in Brooksmart. Yes, I agree, because uh, with regards to the fort, that I think that's in Taytay, municipality of Taytay, where yeah. the mm -mm. Fort de Fuerza or Fort de Santa Isabel is uh, located. Mm -mm. Thank you, sir. Yes, and for hello, Dr. Santiago. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Doblado. And for Dr. Santiago, no, I, I already posted a question, but I'd like to explain it, no? 
Um, and it's probably also related to the um, the question of uh, Dr. Feliz Rodriguez because um, um, I'd like probably to know if the, the document would be accessible soon, no? but was actually written in the um, in the description of uh, Enrique, you know, because we, we've all accepted that it's, it's slave and everything that they're being referred to. But one of the things that I found strange, you know, because here you have someone who will accompany a journey going back to the place where he came from. And he, if he was captured, if he was arrested, if he was bought or anything, um, after so many years of living an area, and all of a sudden you have this opportunity now to arrive home to, to go home, no? Um, why didn't he ex exactly flee from the from the from the expedition when they arrived in the Philippines? No? Um, my my assumption is, and this is just a this is just pure assumption, was that Enrique was probably just more of a quote unquote slave, but probably a trusted um, a trusted uh, part, a trusted part of um, let's say a, a trusted um, aide of Magellan with regards to the. Um, with regards to the uh, going to, of course, to the uh, Molucas, no? um, many said he was an interpreter. So that, I think that was one of the misconceptions that he was Filipino because he understood Visayan. That was the, um, the language before. No? And um, the, the, for me, the puzzle exactly fits because when he uh, eventually was um, about to be, quote unquote, set free, no? Um, because of the death of Magellan, he took offense. No, when Barbosa, I think, insulted him, and um, he, this was suddenly his opportunity now to to be free. But suddenly, it's being taken away from him. So justified, talaga yung galen. The just the, the the anger was justified. No, so so going back again to the to my uh, to the assumption, I want to to ask you this. So probably we can look at it with regards to Enrique's life. Could he have been more of a a slave, but more of a trusted um, servant or someone who uh, Magellan would eventually, um, you know, uh, ask advice from or something. Because I think he was the only one. He may have been one of those who knew that they were about to go to the Moluccas. No, because Magellan would would have just have dragged him along, you no, know, for 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 fun or become become his servant uh, to just to serve him. Yeah, 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 that's my, that's my question. In it. Okay, so based on all the uh, sources that I was able to, uh, to assess, uh, it seems that Magellan treated Enrique very well. Mm. Okay, so the, the notion that they may have been actually more than just master and slave, but real friends is a probability. But it's also very clear that Enrique was aware that after crossing the Pacific, okay, and upon Magellan's death, uh, he would be set free. And that's why after that uh, fateful encounter in Mactan, uh, well, if you, you've read the account, okay, I know, uh, but Enrique seemed to have suffered from some form of trauma. So he was just, he was, uh, I think, bundled up in a blanket and re was refusing to work. And that was what made Barbosa very angry. So his refusal to act as an interpreter for the crew, okay, made Barbosa angry to the point that he told Enrique, that he, I think he called him a dog, okay, and then told him that you're not getting your freedom. And that is what supposedly irked Enrique. So that's what made him angry that he supposedly decided to um, uh, form that uh, conspiracy with the chief of Cebu. So um, my take on that is that Enrique, uh, well, again, this is a speculation, but the promise of freedom can be greater than, you know, just the promise of getting home. Now, uh, Enrique didn't speak Cebuano, okay? So he spoke Malay, and that's why he could, he could only speak to the chieftains of Homonhon and, uh, and Cebu, okay? So, so the idea that uh, Enrique was a Cebuano because he could speak to the people in the Visayas has no basis. I hope I addressed your question, Dr. Torres. Thank you, thank you both. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you both. Okay, so there are so many other questions, but unfortunately it's 12.29.
and the next session will begin at 1 p.m. We only have a 30 minute break because we have a total of 14 papers to be presented today. And so I'm really sorry that I will not be able to accommodate your questions and uh, you cannot also ask them to Professor Doblado, but we will be happy to share our email addresses. Just please get in touch with the um, uh, organizers through PHA 2020 conference at gmail.com and we'll be very happy to address your uh, questions and concerns. Professor Doblado, do you have any final words before we end the session? Oh, please unmute your microphone. I would like to take the opportunity to thank everyone and the organizers for letting me participate in this prestigious uh, event. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Doblado. So on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank all the speakers this morning for their presentations. We will resume at 1 p.m. Thank you very much.